City Council public hearing will now be called to order, Madam Clerk. Ooh. Councilors Kadim? Here. Dion? Here. Kilby? Here. La Liberty LeBeau? Here. Lee? Here. Peckham? Here. Pelletier? Oh, here. Herrera? <laughs> here. President Ponte? Here. I just want to let everybody know Councilor Peckham is under the weather with a sinus infection. He won't be joining us this evening. Uh, he did uh, reach out to uh, Council Vice President and myself today. Uh, wish him a speedy recovery. Um, pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Uh, if TV can hear me, um, it's a really tough uh, radio echo in here uh, in the council chamber, um, just so you guys know in the back. If you can work on that as best as you can, that'd be great. Uh, first item on our agenda in public hearing is an auto repair shop license. Is there a motion to open the hearing? Motion, motion, open, motion the hearings. to open the hearings. Been made by Councilor Pereira, seconded by Councilor Kadim. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Tanonis Babwar of 21 Second Street, Taunton, Mass., doing business as Babar Auto Sales Trust for a license to operate an auto repair shop at 673 Bedford Street, Lot M10009 Assessor's Plan. Is there any proponents that have written or are here to speak on this item? Calling all proponents, Madam Clerk. We have no written proponents. Calling all opponents, any opponents present or have written into the clerk? Madam Clerk. We have no op opponents either. Motion to close the hearing Motion has been made by Councilor Dion, seconded Second. by Councilor Pereira. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Is there a motion to close the hearings? Motion to close. Motion to close all hearings has been made by Councillor Dion, seconded by Councillor Pereira. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Could have done better than that, you know. <laughs> Orva City Council Committee on Finance will now be called to order, Madam Clerk. Councilors Kadim? Here. Dion? Here. Kilby? Here. La Liberty LeBeau? Here. Lee? Here. Peckham? 
Pelletier? Yeah. Pereira? Here. President Ponte. Here. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. First item on our committee on finance tonight is citizens input. Madam Clerk. So a number of people who have written in for citizens input. Uh, there's been nobody that has signed up to speak <coughs> a citizens input tonight. Um, so we're going to give it to the clerk for our citizens input. The first um, was submitted by Albert Coelho. We have been living on Linwood Street since November 2014. Without going into how many times we have spoken to the engineering department, etc., I will try to outline why this street is in desperate need of work. First of all, we live at 89 Linwood Street. The drainage in the street in some places is almost non-existent. We have moved here, <coughs> excuse me, since we have moved here, there have been quite a few new houses built and there are many small children living here now. The situation with potholes is dangerous. Many of the small children are learning to ride bicycles and when I see them riding or trying to in front of my home, I get worried. The potholes are scattered like minefields for a long stretch in front of my house and beyond. Some of them are larger than a manhole cover. The city comes to fill them four or five times a year or more, but they almost immediately break up again with chunks of asphalt being torn up by cars and trucks. I can just picture a child falling into one or worse. From what I've heard about the street, it has never been actually graded, etc., and that shows. For a dead end, we have numerous delivery trucks driving past our house daily. When they pass our house, we feel the floor shake due to the potholes and uneven pavement. We have been paying the runoff taxes since they were in instituted, but there is no city catch basin or runoff collection at all. The runoff goes into the woods, into a pond or something. That system was input by the contractor, Harkins Development, which I believe no longer is in business. I could probably go on and on, but I know you're busy and we are not the only squeaky wheel. Please help us before you hear about a major accident with a child falling into a pothole or something more tragic. I just want the council <coughs> and the community to know um, with respect to the Linwood Street <coughs> item, uh, we had that on our agenda on item two for discussion. However, um, due to circumstances beyond some people's control, uh, we are not going to be, they're not here to have that discussion here tonight regarding Linwood, so we will postpone that item for another meeting uh, when the city planner is uh, available to attend. Mr. President. Councilman C8. I don't know why it was not put on the budget because when I went in for the briefing with the mayor, we spoke about this. On the budget for what? I, I'm sorry, why it's not on the agenda. I don't know what the rationale was that it wasn't on the agenda. But these people on no, that street. Councilor, it is on the agenda for, for committee right, on finance. Right, but you don't have the city planner here. The city planner wasn't, wasn't able to attend the meeting tonight. He wanted to do it remotely, and I didn't find that that was the appropriate venue to do it remotely, being as contentious as an item as it is. So I advised him that it's better to do that live. So he wanted to, he didn't want to, he didn't feel comfortable attending tonight's meeting. Okay, that's why, so it's gonna wait. Just because that's I why. think those people that live in that area it was a contract or whatever, but now we own it and it's not fair to them. Right. I agree with you. Yeah. It has to be resolved. Thank you, I yield. Thank you. Madam Clark. The second item for citizen input is from attorney Rena Brown, 105 Bank Street. Dear council and council president, I feel compelled to provide citizens input yet again, although it pains me to do so. At the meeting of July 14, 2020, I submitted a letter of citizens input at the suggestion of Councillor Peckham. I voiced my concerns about multiple matters involving Councillor Peckham in relation to the Fall River Police Department and other matters. Following the reading of my letter, Councillor Peckham was allowed by the President to impugn me by essentially stating that all of the comments were lies. My intention was not to humiliate and or degrade the Councillor, but to request that the Council and its leadership investigate and educate their freshman Councillors on decorum, ethics and abuse of power. President Ponte allowed members to not ask questions, but insult, degrade, and render opinions toward a defenseless me. I found this to be A, unprofessional, B, outside of city ordinance, and C, lacking decorum. Our city ordinance states, among other things, persons will be allowed to deliver his address without interruption. After the address, the member of the council may ask pertinent questions of the person who may respond if he or she so desires. However, after the reading of my input, Councillor Peckham did not ask questions, but rather called my comments lies, and worse, President Ponte allowed him to do so at length. 
President Ponte further allowed other counselors to insult my comments and position as well. I wonder, had I given this input in person, would President Ponte have allowed Councilor Peckham to call me a liar to my face and others to insult me in person? I would like to implore President Ponte to remember that citizens' input should be considered critical to the council and should be treated as if you were listening to the concerns of a voter in person during campaign season. It is shameful that councilors were allowed to speak the way they were without me being present to defend my position. Therein lies the lack of decorum, not to mention the infringement on our city's ordinance relating to citizens' input. In the event the council membership is not aware of the city's position on citizen input, I have attached a copy for each councilor's review. Furthermore, regarding decorum, decorum not only encompasses behavior, but also appearance. I have observed an alarming and sharp decline in the attire of some councilors during meetings. Whether virtual or not, one would expect councilors to dress appropriately when representing the people and doing the business of Fall River. This would not include extremely casual summer wear, as has been observed of late. I would ask President Ponte to instruct the council on the appropriate attire for a city council meeting. Councilor in seat one, Councilor Kadeem. I yield. Thank you. I have a second um, citizen input filed by uh, Mr. Albert Coelho. After my previous email about the construction on Linwood Street, I received a letter signed by the president of the city council. There's one paragraph that causes concern. It states there are a few streets where the developers have liquidated their companies and the city is left to complete the street, etc. This is unfair to the taxpayers. While I agree that it is unfair, may I remind you that we who live on these streets also pay taxes. In the case of Linwood Street, we pay the runoff tax and I and not one drop of runoff goes into a city drainage system. The street drains off into the woods. As to the situation of developers liquidating, it seems to me that this is negligence on the part of the city for not keeping up with situations, or at the very least, having developers contribute to an escrow account, which might deter them from walking away from a project, or at least have some monies for the city to defray the cost of completion, even if it is pennies on the dollar. Also, I remember the engineer telling me in an email that the money is allocated by the state and the city uses this money to complete these projects, etc. In that case, it seems the money is already there to be used and we the taxpayers must suffer potholes and other problems because the city will not act to correct this problem. I am not a lawyer or government employee, so I do not know how any of this might be done, but I am sure in your infinite wisdom you can take action. It seems from the paperwork online that you have everything you need to make the decision at this meeting. The next was filed by Colin Dias, 560 Ray Street. Good afternoon, Council President and members of the City Council. I would like to continue off on what was discussed at the last City Council meeting regarding the composting bins. Let's have a genuine conversation on the issues. The taxpayers deserve an advocate who will go up and bat for them. What is disingenuous is the fact that this city is considering a composting program without having all the fund fundamentals in place. Buying a couple of medium-sized bins and charging $25 per bin, then telling the city resident to go on their merry way is not a composting program. That's called fiscal mismanagement. Other communities across our Commonwealth have full composting programs, which include a multitude of bins ranging from a few, dollars, few dollar pails to the $25 bins to bins ranging to $100. Let's give the taxpayers some options. Composting, administrative positions to even whole departments where residents can have their questions answered, which I have before. Composting information on municipal websites and whole drop off and pick up sites for individuals post composting. I believe the taxpayers deserve to have all the details and answers if we are going to introduce a composting program into the city, especially if we discuss giving the taxpayers a fiscal break because of the pandemic. Then we're going to ask them to buy composting bins. This all seems very hypocritical to say the least. Also, if we're going to make these bins, shouldn't they be made in Fall River? Another issue, which I believe is one of the most important pieces of this, I saw in a records request to City Hall that these potential composting bins will require pay-as-you-throw bags. I believe there should be some clarity to this, and I hope I just read the information wrong. 
I believe the last thing we need to do is introduce a composting program with the caveat of reintroducing pay as you throw during a pandemic. This composting program feels like we're reintroducing the purple bags. I make these remarks for the whole council and no one specifically. Lastly, I want to briefly touch upon stormwater runoff. I understand the need to reduce the stormwater fee <coughs> and the environmental impact contaminated stormwater can have on our community. I believe we should look into 21st century companies that deal with purifying stormwater runoff. Attached to this input is a link to a company that deals with stormwater runoff. I understand Councilor Dion submitted a great resolution to discuss with reducing the cost of trash and yard waste, et cetera. May I suggest a friendly amendment to include stormwater runoff? I also understand the Committee on Health and Environmental Affairs will be meeting to discuss reducing trash costs as well. Maybe this can be discussed there. I can just say something. Councilman C. They Councilman I, I just want to say something to Mr. Dias because I know he'll be listening no. tonight. Um, Council Lee has worked hard on doing this whole uh, composting. This hasn't gone before the Ordinance Committee or his committee to come up with all of the plans. It was just talking about composting. There's one idea, but there's, there's several others. So I would just urge him to give it a little bit of time and perhaps when we have a meeting, Mr. Dyers can come and, and share his concerns as well. With that, I yield. Thank you. Madam Clerk. <coughs> Councilor in C4, Council Vice President LeBeau. Yes, it is on the ordinance agenda for Thursday. Very good. Noted. It's on the ordinance agenda for Thursday. Madam Clerk. The next is from Cynthia Taboka from 163 Bronson Street. Dear Mr. Ponte, I have received my copy of the letter addressed to resident of Linwood Street area. When I moved into my home in 2012, my house was the only house occupied on Bronson Street. The street at my end flooded during every rainstorm, but I didn't believe it would be long before the street was properly paved. That was eight years ago. My neighbors have tried to contact the developer, but was never given reliable information. As a result, we have drains that are above road level. Our end of the street floods and the water sits for days with no drainage available. I pay taxes of almost $4,000 per year and pay for utilities, including a sewer fee for a sewer that I wish I had. Since I am 72 years old and don't go out much in the evening, I hope that this email will state my concerns properly. I'm relieved to know the council has turned its attention to this issue. The next is Buffy Medeiros of 169 Whitefield Street. I, Buffy Medeiros, am the homeowner of 169 Whitefield Street, and the whole development was not properly built or inspected by Fall River City officials, so therefore this is the reason the streets and all these houses are not and were not completed at all, and the houses in the whole development have had nothing but major issues that the homeowners have had to pay to repair, including myself, with improper fittings to water pipes in the ground, to flooding backyards and flooding streets due to improper drainage or not enough drainage. We pay for stormwater and sewer, but it doesn't go anywhere but our streets and backyards. I've been dealing with these issues along with everyone in this development for years. It's totally unfair the taxes and sewer and stormwater bills we pay to live in these conditions. If there is anything I can do to be of any assistance, please feel free to contact me. I will gladly help in any way I can. And lastly, we have Michelle Cadero of 241 Whitefield Street. My name is Michelle Cadero. My husband Horatio and I purchased our home at 241 Whitefield Street in February of 2016 and since then have been hear hearing that the road will be paved soon. Year after year, nothing, as each year we lose more and more chunks from the entrance to our driveway. Jump forward to when Mayor Correa was facing possible recall, he had all our driveways marked as if they were preparing to pave the road so that we would vote to keep him in. Shocker, guess what, our road didn't get paved. Every time it rains, the road floods in certain areas due to <coughs> improper drainage. As citizens and taxpayers of Whitefield Street, we deserve to have a properly paved and proper drainage. Lord knows we pay enough. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is um, the discussion with the city planner. I just want, once again, to reemphasize um, the point regarding um, um, this specific subdivision area. Um, those who are watching uh, at home, uh, those who are in the audience specifically on this item, uh, this is certainly an item that has caught the attention of this city council and the mayor uh, and his administration. Um, we are working extremely hard uh, collectively uh, to get this resolved as a council. Uh, we recognize that 
the residents in this area have been working and, and dealing with these issues for far so long and, and for too long. Um, and um, I know it was Councilor in seat one who, who suggested that there be a joint meeting with the planning department and or the city planner. Uh, and we are going to do our very best to make sure that we get this back on the agenda at our very next meeting. Um, even if we have to close, the, close it to the public to make our city planner feel comfortable, uh, we will do that um, because we recognize that um, this is a serious matter and all of us collectively want to see this getting resolved for all the residents in that area and in the community that have reached out to all of us over the last four years at least. So is there a motion to table item two? Motion to table. Motion, motion to table, table item two. two has been made by Councilor Kilby. Second. Seconded by Councilor Lee. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Item three, the mayor and the order requesting approval of a five-year contract for school bus transportation in the Whaling City Transit. I know Mr. Pacheco is here. As well as Mr. Sahadi. I make a motion to refer to full council. Second. It's already in full council, I believe. It's already in. Madam Clerk, is that correct? Yes. Yep. It's not on. It's the purpose of uh, for discussion at this point. Is it in full council? It was referred to finance, yeah. It, um, motion to refer the item to full council has been made by Councilor Pereira. Is there a second? It's in the. Um, it is not in full council. It's not. Okay. I'll second. Seconded by Councilor Kilby. Discussion? We will invite our. Um, Mr. Pacheco, Mrs. Hadi, for a brief overview on this item, please, before we do the full referral okay. for discussion. Thank you, Thank you Councilors. Um, the contract is the last contract we have um, to bring forward, um, which will complete our busing needs for the next five years. Uh, this contract is for special education transportation and um, in the um, monitors that would um, accompany these particular buses. This is yellow bus transportation and not vans, and um, it makes up um, the final piece of, uh, of the total transportation uh, for the next five years. Questions from members of the council? Councilor in seat seven, Councilor Pelletier. This is set for five years, and anyway, with everything that's going on, uh, you got a five-year contract. Will there maybe sometime next year, this year, uh, have to uh, eliminate some of the kids on the special buses and, and cost you more for transportation or the city? So um, the school department last night approved a hybrid uh, re-entry, which will be 50% of the students um, will be going one week, 50% will be going another. There will be certain students who are going to attend school every day. And um, with that being said, the transportation that we currently have, uh, that you have before you, uh, those buses will be ample to do that transportation. Um, there may be situations for out of district students that the transportation that we currently have may not be su sufficient. Um, because of the amount of seating on a, on a smaller van, um, we may have to um, add two or three vans to our overall uh, contract. With that being said, um, there are some changes um, with, with the reentry plan that we will not be starting uh, school until, um, in person school, until the uh, 17th um, of, um, of September. So. Um, we do have some time built in there um, where we will um, uh, talk to the bus companies about how we're going to handle that time. And in the plan, it is also uh, showing that Wednesdays are going to be a remote day. So students will go to school Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday will give us the opportunity to do cleaning in the buildings. They will go to school Thursday, Friday, same students Thursday, Friday. Again, Saturday we'll be doing the deep cleaning in the schools. So that, if that progressed, throughout a portion of the year. Those are, again, full days of uh, remote learning for all students, and that will be more buses available for us to fill in on these other items. So what I'm saying is, is that I think the contracts are all inclusive right now, uh, unless something you know, really uh, major happens with the amount of distancing we need on buses. 
Um, we, we feel that there is enough um, of those days off um, that are gonna allow us to get those extra buses that we need without additional cost. All right, this is just for special education? This contract in particular is just special education yellow buses, yellow not buses. buses. Okay. Right. Now, do you have another contract coming up for the rest? All the other contracts have already come before council. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what kind of money is we talking compared to last year that is costing the taxpayers how much more? The overall, uh, the overall bus need uh, transportation cost is $11 million. Um, it's about $300,000 more than last year. Um, we do have some savings on this particular contract, over $600,000 on this particular contract um, through the, the bidding process. Um, we do have some additional costs in, in a couple of the other contracts. We're also dealing with a prevailing wage hike in monitors, so we're dealing with that piece in this contract along with a lot of other um, benefits that the monitors are receiving uh, under um, new regulations for for their particular uh, job. So you tell me between the two contracts, we're only spending 300,000, not only, 300,000 more? More from last year. From last year. Am I right? Um, that, that's, cor that's correct. Um, the last year, I believe the um, total amount in the budget was ten million seven, and this year it's eleven million dollars. Now, on the other end, I mean, uh, how many people are going to put in the buses? Twenty-four on the large buses, and that's there were how many before? Forty? Uh, Forty-five? More than that. More than that. So, so on, on our smaller buses, we were probably putting about sixty-five on the. The, li the little uh, the little guy buses they were probably um, three to a seat and then yeah. on the the older students it's two to a seat and most of these buses would be anywhere from 45 to 60 well it doesn't passengers. It, to me it doesn't add up where uh, you had 45 60 and now you're putting 25 I mean so we're putting where's 24, the balance but so we transport roughly 5,000 students yeah. Of the 10,300, we roughly transport about 5,000 students, of which 500 of those students are at the high schools transported by SRTA buses. So the remainder are transported by buses and vans, combination thereof. Um, and if you divide that number in half, because only half the students are going to school yeah. at the same time, and then we take into consideration that we've received um, a decent percentage, maybe 15 to 20 percent of parents are saying they're transporting their students. Okay. So with all of that put into play, we feel that we have enough buses to do that transportation. As I said, the only wild card and the unknown in this whole piece is the um, out-of-district transportation. So Normally, if, if, uh, uh, for instance, we may be transporting uh, students to Bradley in, in, uh, in Providence, or we may be going um, to one of, the, um, one of the other collaboratives, there may be four people on a van, five people on a van. That's not gonna happen. So that's that van will be down to two. Um, if there's any, obviously, if there's any um, siblings, yeah. it, it changes that number, but um, <coughs> if there are no siblings, then it could be two, possibly three, depending on the vehicle. So that's where we will see the difference. But again, a lot of parents, even with the with the uh, out of district placement are saying that they are going to choose to transport. So all wrapped up, it's, you're saying maybe 300,000 at the most? Well, savings, I'm, I'm saying 300,000. I mean, oh. um, overage of from savings, last year, right. not savings. So we, we're paying 300,000 yeah. yeah. additional, additional costs from last year's expense. Well, you know, I talked to Mary and the mayor about it and it worried me because uh, if you're only putting 25 on a bus and then you gotta get another bus and it's gonna uh, cost a lot of money, but you kinda explained it, it's not gonna be that way. I figured the transportation probably go up, maybe three, four million, but that's not the case. I sure hope not, oh. council, because <laughs> I don't wanna come back here and tell you that I was wrong. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's, 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 it's a plan that's gonna work. The plan, the plan is in place, and, and again, we will not transport 5,000 students a day under the current conditions, and I don't know how long these conditions will be in place. So 
the, the, the design of the, the design yeah. of this program is to transport 5,000 students. Okay. We cannot transport 5,000 students because we have no place to take them once we pick them up. So basically, you got a little break by the parents taking 20% yes. of the kids in? And we have a break of, of breaking the students into two cohorts. And two what happened if 10% changed their mind? 10% we can handle. 20% we still may be able to handle. I don't believe, I don't believe that everyone is as comfortable with everything as we would like them to be. Um, and we see that with parents saying that they may opt for the remote as opposed to in-person education. Yeah. However, um, we do believe that the, the numbers, um, the bus quantity and the way we've tiered the buses is gonna allow us to do what we have to do within the parameters that we're given and within the, the uh, budget. Okay, I just wanna understand one thing. The kids, all the kids are going to go to school Monday and Tuesday? Half the kids will go to school yeah. Monday, Tuesday. Okay. Half the, the same, Half. the same group will go on Thursday, Friday. Okay, that's the one The following week. week, a different group will go on Monday, Tuesday, and a different group on Thursday, Friday. All right, so every other week, one group off. Uh -huh. Right. And? And there are some students who are going to go every week based on needs. But that's all figured out. The ones the who stay week. home for the off week, uh, they get assignments or something? Or do they no, just hang around? It's a regular school day. A regular school day a regular at home? school day for them at home, yes. Okay. We'll see if it works out. Uh, you know, it, uh, I, I thought we were going to spend a lot, lot, lot more money, but if you say that's what it is, then that's what it is. We'll try to keep your feet to the fire so we don't get in trouble. With that, I yield. That. Thank, that, thank, thank, thank you, Councillor. Um, Mrs. Zahadi, if my memory serves me correctly, and I could be wrong, uh, I believe uh, Councillor and C1, Councillor Kadeem, requested a legal opinion with respect to um, the bus contracts uh, from Corporation Council. Um, co am I correct, Councillor? Yeah, the question I had was um, <clears throat> any contracts over three years require council approval. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously they're coming back before us because it's a five-year contract however in the uh, on the agenda it just states the one-year dollar amount so my, my question for legal was whether or not City Council is required to approve a three-year contract and the total funding for that contract or is it just the three-year term does it include the financial aspects if it does include the financial aspect is it one year versus the totality of the contract. Yeah, I, I do recall you asking the question, and I don't. I don't believe we received. I asked the clerk. I don't believe we've received that opinion, Mrs. Zahadi. Do you want to elaborate on that? Um, yes, yeah, certainly, Council President. Um, I have not had any conversations with Corporation Council with regard to either the multi-year contract um, phasing in in terms of awarding a one-year versus the three and the five, and whether or not the total financial impact um, to the city needs to be reflected. Um, Corporation Council will be here later this evening, um, so he may be able so to just, answer the question at that time. So just point of information, I just, you know, if we can get that legal opinion just for our future reference on contracts, but I guess um, if, since Mr. Pacheco's here, if he's got the total dollar amount, if we're going to approve it, I would just suggest that we approve, if that's the, the will of the council, to approve the term of the contracts for the term and the total financial mr. Pacheco just just to so be on the safe side so we're not coming back that's all the contract is is um, based on that dollar amount with an escalator that's built in mm -hmm. not to exceed that escalator which I think is a CPI I believe I'm not it mistaken is. so that's the reason why it is it is not put in as a total dollar amount okay. so the only thing we were requesting was to lock in for a five-year contract with the <coughs> bus company and then the language inside the bid document and the contract would state the mm -hmm. full value of that contract with the escalator. So, Mr. President, just through you, if we can just, when we're taking that vote, if you can just note that to make sure that the, the motion includes that. Just just to be on the safe side, I don't want to... The motion to in, the motion to include... The five-year contract with the, the one-year cost of the $2,603,982 with the escalator uh, based on a CPI for each additional year of the first-year contract. Sure, I'll make sure that I remind you to make that motion. Yeah, just, just in case it gets challenged, it doesn't come back down to us. Yep, so. yep noted. And I just recall that you asked that, at least had the discussion regarding it. Um, so thank you for clarifying that, Councillor. Councillor C5, Councillor Lee. Hi. Um, just to 
quick question about the, the, the current contract. Sometimes in um, certain classrooms, they'll have a child that's more behaviorally inclined that, and, and would need to go to a different location or a different school even. Um, does this type of contract cover those kind of costs if, if, if that child has to then be transferred from home to a different school, like say South Coast Collaborative, for example, and things like that? So you've allocated for that? So this contract does not have that in it. Okay. We do, you approve the five-year contract for Tremblay Bus Company, okay. which is all of our in and out of district van mm -hmm. transportation. And in that contract, it is those okay. vehicles that would do all of that out of, out of uh, how do you How do you allocate for that? Because obviously sometimes those things happen, it can happen without you know, realizing what's going to happen throughout the school year. So ba everything is usually based on the year before. Okay. And mostly through attrition, we see buses go and we see buses come back, you know, the, the same year. Um, there, there are times when we do have extra right. uh, vans, something can come up mid-year. Uh, we could have a student transfer. Yeah. Um, so all of those things are not necessarily figured in. Um, right. And, you, and where do you, wait, like, like, and just to follow up on Council and C7's question, line of questioning, if you are over the budget or you know these, these spontaneous costs do come, um, where do you go from there? You just ask for a transfer? So and in, try the, to estimate in that. the past, um, we've made trips to the council to ask for transfers of additional funds to pay for the transportation. Um, there, are, there have been times when we've had um, dollars funds. above 100 percent net school spending that we were able to um, help the city out in that respect. They were small dollar amounts, maybe three hundred, yep. five hundred thousand um, dollars, that was paid by the school department. So depending on the severity of the shortfall, yeah, okay, you know, would determine that. All right, thank you. I yield. Councilor in C three, Councilor Kilby. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> just just a couple of comments. You, you answered um, most of my questions. The um, with the re the remote learning, special education students. Um, can the special ed education students participate in remote learning? Is my understanding that they, they so depending they, on depending on the severity of the disability will determine, you know, what services that can be provided. Um, the district's remote learning um, or flex academy, as, as we're calling it, if it's going to if they're going to stay remote. So remote learning is part of of the hybrid. The flex academy would be you're in that and you're going to stay okay, remote, sure. but it will all depend on which one they would be in to the amount of services they would receive. We are, we are looking at our um, uh, special population to bring them in um, to schools on a weekly basis. Now, if we go all remote, then, you know, that's not going to be an option uh, or may not be an option. But um, if, if it is a part of this hybrid system that we're doing right now, there will be... Um, challenges to deliver the services that we want to deliver to some students but we are you know working all of that into the plan so the students will be able to receive remote learning at home depending on the severity of the disability so again just to uh, get a little more specific i um i know you're not the director of special education um when in march when we decided to go the, the city just decided to go all remote we did have some ieps with special ed students that were Remote world, and yes, and personally, we're okay. Yes, uh, the other th question I had is um, you stated that we may, s I think you stated maybe you didn't, maybe I heard you wrong, but we um, may see a savings in transportation because parents can decide to take their kids to school. Yes, we pay the parents, don't we? We pay so, the right, so, so the, the parents, parents can be paid. So if parents they decide they want to transfer, transport, we pay time. mileage for that parent to transport their students beyond the if it's an out of district placement, the, the, the district has a responsibility and an obligation to pay for transportation beyond a certain distance and to pay students, um, special ed students, who are being transported uh, or are going to an out of district placement. Based on, we, we look at out of district placements as a service that we can't provide for a variety of reasons. So part of that uh, plan would be that, that if a parent decided that they could transport that student, then we would pay their mileage to and from. Yeah, I just don't want any, anyone here to uh, misinterpret the fact that if parents decide to transport their children because of the risk of the virus, and, and there's a ton of uncertainties, what, yes. and I give you a lot of credit, Ken, for all you do, um, <clears throat> but that's... 
This would be for a, this would be strictly for our other districts. Can kind of more parents decide to transport their kids, special education students? Yes. Will our costs go up possibly? If they if they decide to no, because it, we're we're planning on transporting them. Okay. Oh, oh so, okay. So it's so it's, it's, it's per child. Right. It's labeled per child. Yes. Okay. Right. I yield. My question has been answered. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. In seat two, Councilor Dion. Uh, so clarify this for me. Am I correct in saying so? Fifty percent of the students are going to be transported to school on a given day, given week. Which has been the practice, past practice. But the number of buses we're contracting for doesn't allow with the new um, measures to transport that many students at one time on a bus? Exactly. So, so that piece would be why we're separating the students into two groups. So we couldn't, if with the social distancing, both on transportation and in classroom, we would have a difficult time right now bringing all the students back to the classroom and getting them to school. That's the first piece. The second piece would be um, if, we, if we make the modifications to the school and, and we're allowed to put students closer than the social distancing allowance, we still would have trouble getting them to school because of transportation. So transportation is the key to 50% of the students getting to school. This is all if we're doing the transporting and not the parent. Parent, so, parent drop off and and students walking make up the other fifty percent of the district. Right. So essentially, out of ten thousand students, we're transporting five thousand. We're only going to transport twenty five hundred each week. Exactly. Presumably, the number of buses you're contracting for can accommodate the twenty five hundred without needing additional vehicles. It can, except as I said, the out of district placement could be a problem, and Correct. depending on how many students either choose to opt out and do remote or parents transport that number is the unknown that I, I really can't put my finger on how many buses we're going to need if it, it was if everything is exactly the way it is now we're going to need a certain amount of buses for our larger locations if right. we're transporting one or two students it doesn't change the transportation what changes is if we're going with four or five or six students in a van going to a, a particular place, that would take two vans, two bands, maybe three. Correct. So that is our extra cost. In which case, you're doubling or tripling the cost. Exactly. Because you have to go by that contract price. Exactly. And it's that price per vehicle. We're, we're paying, with the price is per vehicle, not by the student. So it, they're being, the, the, the bus companies are not the one putting in the restriction of how many students are on the bus. That's being put in by, by an outside source. So. That's why we'd have to add those buses. So another potential problem also could be, let's assume that we, you know, that, that, that parents don't opt in on driving their own children for whatever reason. Maybe they can't. They're working. Whatever the case may be. So now we need double or triple the buses. Do we know for sure that the bus companies even have the manpower to do that? So most bus companies will tell you that um, they have a little bit of residual, you know, so, so a percentage of overage on, on the equipment. Um, they need a percentage of overage just for breakdowns. Um, so there is a certain amount of, of equipment that's available to us. Um, but everyone's in this same, so to speak, boat that we're in. And they're going to need buses too. So it's not like the Four River companies could go a couple of towns over and, and borrow buses from other companies. That's not going to be the case. The only issue is, is that bus companies um, at least the, the uh, four bus companies that we've been using have upgraded their fleet. We're now looking at much newer buses that are servicing our students. By, by that sheer fact alone, we know that the, the, um, the breakdown rate is not going to be what it was. Um, so those extra buses that are sitting could be utilized for certain situations. And we're not sure that everyone's going back to school. So if our, if our neighbors are not going back to school and those companies are some of the same companies we use, there are a lot of buses available. Um, so In which I, case we wouldn't probably exactly. need even what we've contracted for. Right. right. Now, um, in terms of the bus monitors, that increase is very significant. It is. I've asked this question before, but I've never asked you. Um, why such a significant dollar so, amount? 
I mean, the minimum wage, the minimum wage, with the minimum wage increasing, there was an, a lot of other benefits that came along with that wage increase for the, which was a lot of the benefits that everyone else would normally get, but these part-time workers weren't subject to getting those uh, benefits. With that wage increase, some of these benefits came along with that, and those federal laws now force um, some of those issues to trickle down, obviously, to us from the bus companies. So the so requirement for the minimum number of hours has actually been decreased? No, no, it's, well, yeah, as far as, right, as far as the requirements in order to get some of these benefits, right. yes. And, and the, the other issue is um, bus monitors and bus drivers are very difficult to keep for most of these companies. So as they're negotiating new contracts, obviously they're trying to entice people to come and work for their particular companies. Some of that included um, signing bonuses, different things that other companies would use to attract people. The bus companies are doing the same thing. So in their bidding process, some of these companies use that as part of the bid spec. Okay, and, and, then, and one other question that I've asked, and again, not of you, is um, I know we have um, the ability to renegotiate under certain circumstances or if things happen out, outside of the uh, contract. Um, what about out clause? Like, for instance, if let's say the kids go to school for two months and then they aren't allowed to go for two months and then they're back for two months, is there anything in there um, in terms of not having to pay the transportation for those gaps? So. In the, on the, uh, in the previous one-year contract, there was the, the force, ma force majeure clause that would allow um, the city and the bus company to get out of a contract if there was a, a, a catastrophe that they, you mm -hmm. know, that could not be, that was not caused by either one. Um, it is in this contract, and there's also some language in this contract that um, uh, allows us to go back and negotiate as opposed to the other contract that didn't have that. It was straight. We, we read the page 39 of the contract that said for, force majeure. You do a better job than I do. <laughs> I always want to add the E on the end and give it a little twist. But I, uh, So I think that the fact that we have um, language in this contract that's going to get us to the table with the bus companies um, is, is – um, a, a difference in what we're doing and that that was put into the language on this contract okay um, so essentially we do was, have a safeguard yes. for uh, situations outside yes. of our control where services are not rendered yes okay thank you with that I yield anything further no. hearing none motion or for the item to full council has been made and seconded hearing no further discussion all those in favor I have <laughs> opposed the guys have it thank you Mr. Pacheco thank you you're welcome Next item on our agenda is an order uh, for Community Preservation Act funds for FY 2021 community projects and community preservation committees. 2020 final report. Is that in full council? Yes. Uh, yeah, it is in full council. Yes. Um, Mr. Souza is here. Welcome him to the table for a brief overview. I have a question. Councilor in seat eight, Councilor Pereira. Uh, I'll recognize you first after Mr. Souza just sure. gives us a brief overview. Councilors. So um, I'm here for the FY21 um, appropriation for the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, we started our process last September, um, allowing applicants to apply for CPC funding. Um, 28 applicants came before us September 1st to receive, um, to, to give us their applications. Uh, at that point, we spoke of the um, sort of the rules that the committee has regarding um, CPC applications. The eligibility round was a point where we had the applicants come down. Our committee was more of a round table meeting ourselves asking applicants questions and just really uh, figuring out whether the applications were eligible or ineligible. Uh, at that point, we um, sent letters to applicants who uh, were eligible and at that point they gave them their um, notification for funding which would happen in February 1st so they had like three months to go through and and give us a funding application 
uh, of the 28 applicants that received eligibility, um, 19 were eligible and 16 made it to the funding hearing. When the funding hearings came around, we had the applicants come before us and they <coughs> gave us their presentation of their projects and we you know, vetted them out uh, with questions we had regarding their projects. And then once that was done, we had a round table meetings again for the committee to discuss who would be uh, uh, funded for the project. Uh, we ended up funding 10 projects. And at that point, we COVID came around, so we, we didn't continue our, our meetings for probably a month or two. We, we had the meetings again. One of the projects dropped out, which brought us down to nine projects that we funded. Just recently in um, July, one project we found out um, through the newspaper had started its project already, um, the Adams House. And our committee had said that projects could not be started until funding was uh, voted by the, the city council. So we, we met again and through talking with the Community Preservation Coalition in Boston, with their guidance, looking at the applicant's funding application in the um, timeline that he said he would work on the project, the project was supposed to start in the third quarter of 2020, and we found out the project had started in the first quarter of 2020. So we voted to decline that project, which brought us down to eight projects, which gives us the uh, uh, um, appropriation order before you. So basically, that was the process of our FY21 year. Uh, Mr. Susan, just for a point of clarification, eight project, how many projects under right. historic preservation? Um, uh, because I'm seeing the, um, the six music. under historic preservation. All right, and just for the community that's watching at home, one that. under open space and one under community housing. Okay, so just so everybody's aware who's watching at home, the open space recreation is a bioreserve conservation and land <coughs> acquisition. Yes, the historic preservation items is the Maritime Museum, the Lafayette Durfee House, the Fall River School Department, pres uh, Preserving Water Department documents. Water Street Private and the Bank Street Armory. Is that correct? Correct. You have administrative costs of 45000 and the community housing project of 77 Freedom Street, which is a private project, correct? Co correct. Yes. Mrs. Sahadi, you want to weigh in? Um, yes, the open space also includes the payment of the bonds for both the uh, Mount Hope bike path as oh, well yeah. as the bio reserve. Okay. Anything further, Mr. Souza? Uh, no. Councilor Encide, Councilor Pereira. Yeah, um, Mr. Souza, I, I did watch the Community Preservation Committee meeting. I'm happy to hear you today telling us of one of the projects and why the committee voted to not fund that project because a few weeks ago when this was before us and it was tabled because we didn't have all of the information, that project was, was on here. And now, you know, watching the meeting, you made statement, well, we'll just put it back, they won't notice. So I'm glad that you did come and talk to us about it because I certainly did notice that there was a project missing. Um, I know that you read a letter from whoever from the state yes. that works with you. I'd like to have a copy of that letter uh, okay. when you have an opportunity to okay. do so. I can have Sandy send it to the court. And, you know, and the other thing is, on your application, the application that people fill out yep. for community, Nowhere on that application, because I got my hands on a copy of it, nowhere on that application does it talk to the fact that you cannot start a project until you receive money. Nowhere on that, that is, application that is correct. does it say and that. Since this issue, we've edited it for this coming round. Right, but you've edited it for this coming round. Yeah. But if it wasn't there for the Adams House, I think that's disingenuous. Well, that, 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 is, that is true, except in his application, which I have here, we could also send to you, we ask for a timeline of when the project should start. In that timeline, the project was to start in the third quarter of 2020. So we were looking at that in itself as the guideline for us right. to accept or not accept the project. So we were thinking it was going to start July 1st. And 
COVID wasn't around at that time. No, so. and I think COVID put a, a, a kick on a lot of things because one of your board members, as a matter of fact, I believe his name is Mr. Ferreira. Yes. Who's a new member. He made mention of the fact that because of COVID, they might have had to start the project earlier because of COVID. It started in February. And, it started in you know, February. Whenever. But COVID and, started in March. Right. But they wouldn't have completed it at, at that point. I just, I just don't think that, that that was fair, and I'm glad that that's going to be changed um, on your application. I think that it needs to be changed. But um, other than that, when I look at, you know, the Marine Museum and the Lafayette Durfee House, the Lafayette Durfee House, I don't know if everybody has been there, but that mm. place is pretty spectacular. It is. Uh, and I would encourage people um, to visit it. And I like the <clears throat> Water Department preserving documents because, ironically, I asked for a list of all the land that yeah. was owned by the Water Department, and I don't have all that information. So maybe they need to do a better job of preserving their documents. Yeah, hopefully it continues past, because they, they actually brought some of the documents before us. They were quite amazing, and then they were really in, in dire straits of needing preservation. So hopefully There are. I mean, I, I got a lot us. of them at an auction. A lot of different city records at an auction because somebody had thrown them out and I mm -hmm. bought them at an auction so I can certainly share those back with the city um, other than that I don't have a problem uh, supporting this I, I just did want to you know me you know me mr. Seuss if I have something to say I'm gonna tell you I'm not gonna go behind your back I, I just didn't like the way that uh, that we, that we went did down. we did speak of it we of did speak of it but it was not in the application and now now it will be but like you say we also look at the questions in each application and right. one of them specifically is the time frame of when a project is to begin and end and that's part of our decision making process also in that particular right. application it was to start on july 1st 2020 at prior to COVID, we probably would have been yeah. funded already at that point so i think that was part of our reasoning for funding it but after finding out it started in February of 2020, that's where we kind of like stood back and read. Well, if we wouldn't have had COVID, you would have had more meetings, obviously, and this correct. probably would have come to us earlier. Correct. And then because of COVID, you might have had developers who said, you know what, because of COVID, we're not doing this project or this project, we can start on your project mm -hmm. sooner. And they jumped it and started on their project. So because that happened, it just seems to be a comedy of, of errors all around. But in the end, somebody got stuck $115,000 well, on, on part of that. I know that they can go back and reapply yeah. again should they choose to do that. I just think the Adams House is a really good project to be done. I'd hate to see something in such a nice area of the city um, you know, have turned into something else. Um, it was a bed facility that didn't need the votes of anybody if somebody wanted to put a bed. And in speaking with um, Councilor Kilby the other day, he enlightened me that Lafayette actually slept there. Um, which was pretty amazing at the age of 23. 20, 20, 23 as well. Yeah, I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. And that's what this is about, trying to keep our historic properties. And yeah, no, it is. So, I mean, the know. other thing that was very exciting about that project was that it was a housing project. Um, and we're lacking that part of um, CPC because we for several years we've requested from the Housing Authority to appoint a member to our board which is re required by the state and we haven't had a Housing Authority board member for probably three to four years um, so with a Housing Authority board member we would hope we would get more housing projects but we were excited and we have in the past given money to housing projects because we don't have anybody from housing to give us any projects and that was one. So maybe we could send a letter to the Housing Authority well, letting them know if, if that. I would, I would appreciate if you would yeah. because we have several times and we have received no feedback. Well, um, to the President, if we could send a letter to the Housing Authority requesting that they get a member from the Housing Authority on the board if we have to take a vote on that or if we, 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 we I mean, actually, I, we've actually spoken to the state about this also and uh, they were actually disappointed that a Housing Authority member is not on it because this requirement of, of uh, CPA is hoping that housing is going to like you know uh, get better because of this well and we as a council had a member on your board and that person has since resigned and I was just speaking to council mm -hmm. president before the meeting started about getting someone uh, on that board and he's in agreement with that we need to fill that position 
But that just happened recently. Right. It's not yes. like you haven't had anybody. It's been weeks for that. Our yeah. appointee there for yeah, no, years, that was but. only been like three weeks. Yeah, yeah. So we're working on that too. Thank but you. anyway, thank you, Mr. Souza, for the work okay. that you do. Thank you. Um, as chairman of the um, CPC, thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor in C three, Councillor Kilby. Yes, just <clears throat> before I have my questions, my understanding, I did read that uh, from the Thor Stoic Photo Club. Mm -hmm. um, I. I always peruse that, peruse that uh, website when I'm on Facebook. Uh, it stated that he stood in Portsmouth and they had a picture of the house mm -hmm. in Portsmouth. Then the quotes were saying he stood here too. Mm -hmm. Like Linda said, 23 years old, I think people matured a lot quicker back then. Um, died earlier too, I guess, right? <laughs> so, um, my questions. Um, last time around, of course, we had a different administration. It was somewhat controversial uh, with regard to some of the private individuals who mm -hmm received money, and you know, like I say I don't want to look back at those times, but um, so out of, out of the awards this time around, um, how many private are they and how many public? Um, private there were one, and everything else was, well the land acquisition, um, the one, one, uh, one private uh, homeowner, I would say, uh, there were one, two, I'm, I'm wrong, no, two, Water Street, uh, the building on Water Street, and the Freedom Street uh, Firehouse were the two privately owned properties. And then there were two um, nonprofit organizations, the Water Department for the Bioreserve, the um, school, department. school Department building, and the water department documents. Great. And my and that question is not to try to... And even on, on, on the private thing, too, like, not everyone is in favor of funding private projects, and I'll put it out there saying I'm not. I remember. Because, I mean, I, I own a building, it's 100 years old, and I don't think that the population of Fall River paying taxes should pay for my property to be reshingled. So that's where I come off of that. Right. I, we never so, had any promise, pri private conversations last time, but I did ask you. Yeah, but I, that, I you, personally you am that not. Clear I mean, I, that's my opinion on the board and everyone we have, we're supposed to have nine, but at the moment we have yeah. seven. Well, as a general, but we all have our own as a general, ideas. Yeah. As a general rule, it's, that's how I feel as well. There's always a And not everybody feels there, that right? way, and that's okay, too. Yeah. So that leads to my next question. How, how did the votes go? Was there consensus? Uh, well, on the Adams House, division? I'll say, on the Adams House, it was 7 to 2 in favor of funding it. Um, most of them, I think, were quite unanimous, I think. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. Private ones, like say, I, I voted no on all the privates myself, and I don't know who else did or didn't, but I know for sure the Adams House, there were two no votes. Um, just because everyone has their own personal opinion. Yeah. Others are not in favor of privates, but also think that the, the project is so important that they still vote for it, which is okay too. Thank you, you know? Mr. Susan. And finally, um, uh, were any awards given to individuals who received previous awards that didn't fulfill their obligations? No. I mean, his, uh, Lafayette Durfee House has been funded almost every year. I mean, and they've, they're, this is their last funding, I believe, for a while. Um, it, it, the house is fully restored, and Councilor Pereira is correct. I mean, if you haven't seen I've it, seen it's, it's incredible. It's the fireplace, the the what they've done, and and um, how much activity they've generated already. It's it's outstanding. Uh, the one I'm mostly excited about, I think, is the school department building. Uh, I was glad to see that one. I mean, that's exactly why CPA was enacted originally to fix municipal properties to help nonprofit organizations. So those kind of really are. Personally, to me, kind of the ones I really gravitate to. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I appreciate Thank all your you. work and your volunteers. I yield. Thank you, Councillor in C1. Councillor Kadeem. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just in terms, of, you made a statement, and I tend to agree with you. Um, you know, the public grant programs and then the private ones, and um, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to to also approve some of these private ones, but. Um, just in terms of that, I, I just got a question because I know we, we do have some private ones. Because the CPA is um, city money, we, we obviously have to take some type of ownership, you know, and, and have some conveyance coming over to the to the city to be able to utilize these monies on the private um, in these private buildings. <clears throat> With that being said, the some of the ownership obviously is the the restrictions, and, and that's all outlined by uh, MGL 184. But 
I don't know. I mean, the city council is the only one that can actually accept um, these restrictions, and I don't know that we've ever accepted any of the restrictions. So, Mr. President, through you, can can we have <laughs> Corporation Council just review? Um, you know, obviously, there's an understanding that with the CPA grants, uh, that are, any monies that are used, whether it's historic, open space, that you've got a permanent restriction on it. But the city council has never voted on those conveyance of those deed restrictions. And also, I'm just kind of curious to see how many of those restrictions actu actually have been registered with the um, registry of deeds. I can honestly tell you, not many, because we've had through the years problems with corporation council following through it all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I and, and this corporation council acts I think is the most active we've had at the moment so hopefully shortly you yep. the majority is and, done. Th and this and, and quite honestly it's, it's not a reflection on the CPC committee I mean no. there's a lot of laws that go into the CPA and all that other good stuff but I but I think from from a legal standpoint we need to make sure that we we are doing this if we have not done that I, I think we need to make sure that we catch up on all the projects that we have actually put funding to I agree. because then you we're starting to violate Massachusetts general law and then some federal laws with the funding of public money versus versus private. So, um, again, in, in all the years that I've been here, I don't know that we've, at least my recollection, that we've actually approved the restrictions that are associated with the it. The deed so, restriction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have as a body. Uh, um, so if we, can, if we can just look into that and then maybe work with the, um, actually have corporation council either just work with the, the chairperson of the CPC yeah. to, to figure out what we, we need to we do. We currently have um, an attorney on board um, who is Paul Machado, Paul Machado who is mm -hmm. actually very active in this with corporation council right now. So it's kind of like the best connection we've had with yeah. that. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's just, I just want to make sure we're dotting our I's and crossing our I T's. Agree. That's, that's all. And I apologize. I'm fighting allergies. So um, I promise it's not a, a COVID cough. It's, it's, it's <laughs> Very active. Um, the, I guess the question I had was the Adams House. Um, so can you just explain a little bit? Because I, I guess I'm, I'm concerned, and I, I, I guess I don't necessarily agree with the statement that was made in terms of we have the Adams House coming before us. Now, whether the council agrees on the project or not, um, your committee vetted the project, thought it was a, a viable project for the use of the CPCs, but because they started the work early, it, yes. it's removed I, yes I'm just I'm just not following that well in in their timeline um, they said they were going to start the project in July when we believe funding would be it would be funded at that point mm -hmm. so looking at that as we went through the projects we thought it would be a viable project and we voted for it in February then in July we we when the funding is still not actually voted on Mm -hmm. We see that the project is ninety percent complete. It's like we, they don't even the, the funds aren't even allocated yet, and this project's almost finished. Like, how can that be? So, but why why would the CPC care about whether or not they, the owner of the property, started the work early? I mean, be, the, because at that point, like, why are you asking for CPC money if you have the money to do it? Well, it could just be a cash flow situation, right? So they could they could have a loan from a bank, and then the exposure is on the individual. And I, I, right. don't, I don't know. But, I don't but, know all right, the. But I, and the CPC side, we we think that funds. At least I'll speak for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that funds should be allocated to whether it's a, a municipal property or a private uh, or a, or a um, nonprofit organization because they don't have the funds to fix whatever the particular building article, whatever it is. And we, we did two emergency fundings this year. One was for the library roof. Yeah. I mean, the city didn't have the funds. You know the whole story behind that and how it was such a yeah. big hot item. Um, we took the CPC funds because we saw it was that important. It was an emergency to allocate funds to that immediately. So if you just hear me out for a second and just this is my own opinion, um, you know, from the standpoint that the CPC approved this project, obviously understands the value of that historic building, mm -hmm. whether the individual started the project earlier or not, to me doesn't make any sense because number one, we don't know what the cash flow situation looks like. He could have had a construction loan with the understanding that he was potentially going to receive some reimbursement through you know, obviously identifying where it's going. City projects, we, we do this all the time. I mean, we, we, we start some work in advance of reimbursements coming in, hoping yep. that the grants are coming in. So um, I don't know that that mindset or logic should impact any project if it's a valid project, right? Well, so if we, the, and, and the, and the other piece to it is, is if the individual, from, from a, a monetary standpoint, if, if they're pushing in and, and their cost is looking like the construction costs are starting to increase, you know, and, and they're only approved for so much. I think you know why not 
pull the trigger and start to get some of this work done sooner than than later. So I, I don't know that I I, I guess well part agree of part of our part of our decision I think also was we had sent the letter to the uh, community preservation coalition, and in that letter one of the things they talked about about this this type of funding thing is that the public's image of while wow, you're funding a project and they hear they, they have the money to do it why are we giving them CPA money when they get, they have the money to fix that project so that was part of the the um, conversation with them too so that was part of our decision making process too like wow it looks you know it's possible that, you know they have enough money why are they asking for, for money from us mm -hmm. you know so that was part of the conversation and <coughs> that possibly fit into the people our, our board's decision on every like I say it's, it's eight people everyone has their own thoughts and process and mm -hmm. how they go through it but um i think that was part of the reasoning okay i mean we just i'm just gonna agree to disagree um it's yep, just it's one fine. of those things like that and we and we all do on our board all right. the time yeah so i, I mean I, I just don't think that that individual or that project should be penalized because they they started earlier that's that's my take yeah that's a, that's a good um, opinion i guess with that uh just We've got this on the agenda for approvals. It's got to be we, forward. We do, we do have an appropriation order before us. Yes. Okay. So, so, so if, if, we, if we run we run into this every year, just through you, Mr. President. Um, my understanding is that we're doing the appropriation, and then um, we take each I project don't. individually because the council has the authority to either accept, reject, or, or reduce. Uh, reduce. So. Yeah. Correct. I just want to make sure that. So, we're so we have the appropriation order before us for each individual item so the CPA administrative expense expenses mm -hmm. the open space the historic resources in the community housing project as four individual items in the appropriation order to equal yep. 871 mm -hmm. so we will be taking each item in the appropriation order individually and it will be up to the council to reduce reject or approve <coughs> so I guess there's a little bit of a disconnect so I, I agree with that so those three categories or four categories four. Um, that we have to approve that's in my mind is one vote the second vote is the actual appropriation of each project that comes before us mm -hmm. for that so I think there's uh, I mean there's a handful of votes that need to be taken based on each project that's before us because um, you know it's, it's based on the recommendation of the CPC but we've got for instance um, you know community uh, the historic preservation has one two three four five six projects right so the council shouldn't be voting on a totality of those projects because, you know, if the Bank Street Armory shouldn't impact whether or not we want to approve the Water Street project because mm -hmm. one's private, one's mm -hmm. public. So that's what we did last year. Yep. Right. Okay. That's all. I, I just want to make yep. sure that. So we will. We're clear we will. On that. We will go through under historic preservation each item individually, and reduce, reject, or approve. Okay. Specifically, and then you have an appropriation order if it all balances out to approve, which is what I believe we did last year. That's why you're the council president. I have all the faith in you. With that, I yield. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor. And C5, Councillor Lee. How you doing? Good. So I, just so I, just so I understand the process, I, the, the, my questions are more designed on the process. If I'm, just correct me where I'm wrong. Did you say that it wasn't until you saw it in a newspaper article as to when you determined when the project started? Uh, actually, yes. We, through the application, it sounded like it was going to start in July. And then the newspaper article said that it was 90% complete in July. So just for the purpose of, of the process, how, how would you have figured that out if the, art, if the news article wasn't out there? I, I don't think I would have. Huh. I, I don't think we would have. Because <laughs> we, we we're not monitoring buildings and properties that we have no reason to monitor. And so $115,000... On, was on the line and it was really based on a news article that was the difference maker that is true wow so in the future do you have do you feel like there's going to be a mechanism in place to uh to, to more vet when the timing of these um projects start so that way well yeah i mean like like council Pereira was saying it's now in our fund, funding application that in order to get funds you cannot start the project until the grant agreement is signed so that and that would, well, that, that would, would eliminate that process. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, if if you have a building where you're working inside and no one has access to it, you could be working on it. How do I know that? Right. You're not going to go in the building. Right. So it actually could still possibly happen, literally. Right. 
Um, the, the other thing too is um, just I, my question was very similar to, to uh, question seat one where I wanted to understand the reason the difference between someone starting a project in February or July as to why the reasoning why the funding would come down you you explained it that if the person appeared not to need the funds then why would we approve it was that well that was something that came down from the coalition that was a question not a okay. a statement or a uh, it's not a uh, an exact law but it was just a statement that a question could be that you know the public out there in general could be saying hey why are you giving them money right. when they've already worked on this thing and they have the money to work on it and so that was just a and is it assumed in in general is it assumed that if a person or a group um, apply for your funding that they don't have enough to make their project happen is that it's possible it's part of the assumption process sorry it's possible that, that's you know those are the only two things I just wanted to know if there was a mechanism in place that you can vet when they start a project because it seems like a lot of money is on the line when the, if they did start this project like earlier I say than usual. I mean, you think of a building in general if they were doing interior work and we don't have access to the building and we you know they didn't get funded yet and they're using their own funds how do we know that that's happening in mm -hmm. general we we might not never know that even if we put this new you know <coughs> that, that new writing in place there's still a way around is what you're saying so possibly yeah i mean if you're doing a roof it's pretty yeah i mean I pretty much see if it's happening yeah. and know? i and i and i really i mean i would like to see all you know all the properties that we have that are you know that need work or that and, can and be the Adams house is, is a phenomenal good. property yes i mean yes. And we we like the fact that it was a housing property yeah you know I, I, I want to, you know, obviously I want to see a lot of our, our properties be used, but um, but it does, it's a little disheartening. Maybe not for this particular individual who, you know, appears to have the funding to take care of their projects, but just in general for other people who are out there that do want to invest in, in properties in Fall River and want to utilize CPA funds, that they understand this process, that they understand the reasoning behind approvals and disapprovals. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason why we asked. Yeah, I mean, we also try and... Um, there's there's many different reasonings on why particular projects. I mean, we try to like you want to make it a citywide consistent thing. I mean, too. It's supposed to be. Right? It's supposed to benefit the residents of the city, the entire city, yeah. not just. But but the center of our city is really where the most historical properties. I'll say, mm -hmm. are. it's where the city began, kind of, you know, in in the uh, uh, in a sense. Um, but we we really try and spread the projects throughout the city. But the South End, pro historical wise, there's no, we don't we just don't get a lot of applications there we did get one mm -hmm. um, and we have funded several others but it's not like the majority of our projects come from the center of the city of yeah lower highlands highlands area yeah <laughs> but thank you for uh, I, I yield thank you thank you council before <coughs> i acknowledge our colleague in seat two councilman c1 you have a point of information uh just to my colleague in seat five and I, I think i think he understands this but where i was going with this and i want to make sure that i was clear is is i know the project and this is probably why i don't really number one i i think the the, the rules change midstream, right? So I, I don't think that's fair, right? So I think if you're going to change the rules, I think you got to stop with a new round, um, not in the middle of where we're going. But to your to Councilman Seat Five's point, what we're essentially doing with the CPCs is saying that there's there's a historic value to this property. Now, what we're doing for the hundred and fifty thousand that we're giving that individual for whatever I, I think it was remediation or hazard re has removal, uh, or asbestos removal, whatever that was we're funding that but what we're really funding is to historical. get that restriction right yeah. to make sure that that property is valued as historic so that it can never be demolished and it has to be maintained mm -hmm. so the cpc is making a determination and a judgment to say number one that that project is worthy of what's going on and two what we get in return is the real conveyance and ownership of that deed restriction that's going to be placed now we're also supposed to kick it over to a nonprofit to make sure that they're enforcing that right so if we get any conservation land when we get the conservation land, we're supposed to kick it over to a nonprofit. They they enforce these conservation restrictions, things of that nature. So, um, the only thing I would ask the council is, is if you feel like the Adams House and the CPC felt the, the, that the Adams House was worth saving and has a historical value to it, and mm -hmm. it was approved the first time, I think we should be making sure that we go honor, forward honor that, yeah. honor that, regardless yeah. of when it started, because right. we're getting something in return, and I don't want to diminish that portion of it because. You know, again, in, in, in two years, if, if for whatever reason, whatever they felt like the project was going to move forward with is not working yep. in the economic environment, there's nothing to say that they can turn around and, and demo that. And, and my concern, so. my concern when I hear this is primarily about 
people who want to invest in the city in the future mm -hmm. and they want to apply for these funding these fundings i want to make sure they understand the the the, the, the intricate part of that like from february to july is not a long time in my opinion mm -hmm. but that was a difference between hundred fifteen thousand dollars in this case so i want to uh, 115 right yeah so i i want to make sure that when we talk about this, that the people out there or people in the future who are looking to invest or looking to apply for these fund these funds understand that that you know it's it's really vital and I'm glad that you you know provide more detail as to the reasons why we you know we go through this process and the, and the other piece I mean you, we just have to look at NB Borden right the school we we saw that there's there's a lot of controversy about that being demolished and stuff like this that's something that's by doing the CPC stuff is is what is going to really preserve these historic buildings right mm -hmm. listen what. We'd all be naive if, if we thought that the developer isn't making money, right? Right. If they're gonna a, a smart business person is gonna try to leverage all the mm -hmm. financing and, and investment Correct. monies that they possibly can mm -hmm. to make a project number one work and make money. So it to me, it's not about them making money or anything like that. It, it's that we're getting value in return. And you know, when we start looking at our properties, we've talked about this uh, a number of times. It, it, we're seeing you know mills getting demolished, buildings that we should be trying to save and really kind of revitalizing with mixed use and things like that, like other communities are doing, and we just don't do a good enough job mm -hmm. for that. The only thing I would say is is that you'd hate to lose the Adams House because, you know, somebody started a project, you know, a, a couple of months earlier. That That's that's my only take, and I, and I think the motion that I, I, I'll be putting forward just so that counselors know moving um, when we get to full council, and since the chairperson's here so he's not caught off guard, while we can't um, put any new proposals on the table because it's based on the recommendation. What I would like the council to do is just approve the Adams House project based on their initial recommendation and forward it back to CPC for their reconsideration of that project so that if they do want to reconsider it, they have the ability to go ahead, reconsider that project, and just have the authority under the council to reissue that and not have to come back to the council. So that, I mean, that, that's just something I, uh, a motion I'm going to make, whether or not it has the support, mm -hmm. uh, is up to the council. But I just, you know, feel like that that project is is important enough to, to do that. Can I just get clarification? Is it 115 or 150? 115. 115. 115. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because yeah. he said 150 and I said 115. So well, yeah. Make sure. I yield. Thank you. Um, uh, I yield too as well. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, recognize our colleague in seat two, Councilor Dion. Hi. How are you? Hi, Michelle. Is there, are there any type of um, credits or funding that would preclude someone for qualifying for CPA monies? Like in other words, I mean, there's different state grants, there's TIFs, there's ties, there's no. all forms of the, monies that the, people the can the apply more, for. The more funds they, that, that are, are acquired to, to move a project forward, it's definitely more favorable for you. You know, whether it's grants or TIFs or historic tax credits like all of those things i mean we look at it as a much more favorable project because wow it's really going to it makes it more viable so we like when that happens it, it's very it doesn't seem to happen as much as we like. <coughs> okay um in terms of the uh deed restrictions now is there document any type of documentation or anything in writing that uh like an outline that would list the different types of deed restrictions well, because some i mean i don't know i know of some of them but i don't know all the deed yeah, restrictions on these properties category. one for open space one for historic preservation one for community housing so there's three there's three and the um deed restrictions um after the fact are they recorded are they documented somewhere they have, they, they they need to be recorded with the uh, registry of deeds that's where our problem is That's where our problem is. They, were, they we haven't had the corporation council to go through this process, and this corporation council is extremely active right now in this process with our with them. So, so essentially, you have a list of properties that that needs to be done. Yes. Okay. Thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you, Councillor in C four, Council Vice President Lebeau. I just have a question on the process as well. As far as the Adams House, were they brought back in to ask why they started early? I called them twice. And I didn't receive any response. So, and we had scheduled a meeting, but I wanted to speak um, first with them. Uh, but I, I, like I say, I, I, we did not speak with them. I called to try to, and I never got a restricted phone call. So, do they know their funding is pulled? Yes, I spoke with them after the fact already. After the fact, okay. And yes. uh, can you just repeat again when they, when people are approved, are they told when they can start? Once the grant agreement is is signed but we had brought that up earlier last year about 
not fund not being able to start we had several applicants call us asking if they could start ahead of time and we told them you could not start until the grant agreement was signed okay and this was for did you say it was for asbestos asbestos removal so it would have been the first part of their project yes so it would have held up the entire timeline i'm not yeah, sure so what timeline they're on right so in the like i say back back into the funding application in the timeline and we have a bunch of questions that they have to answer one of the questions is give us a timeline of this project this project was supposed to begin according to the funding application july 1st 2020 when the when the newspaper article came out it started in february so it was disingenuous to say J july 1st to us because we are looking at that saying oh this is this is fine by that time the funding will be will happen and the project can start accordingly then we find out it's 90 percent complete already and that's why we had a meeting again and that's why it got defunded because it, it just didn't match up correctly. All right, I yield, thank you. Thank you, Councillor in seat eight, Councillor Pereira. A couple of things. One, my colleague in seat number one asked about deed restrictions. When uh, we put attorney Paul Machado on the CPC board years ago, he, he sent everything to Macy, to Judge Macy to get that done, or attorney Macy. That was never done. It just kept falling to the side. Just recently, he sent three copies of deed restriction um, diagrams or what have you, legal forms. He sent those to Attorney Rumsey. Attorney Rumsey is now working with him on that because you're absolutely right. There was no deed restriction. Um, and, and he got off of the CPC board and he just got put back on. So he's back, it's been five years that Attorney Machado's been working on this, so he's right on it. <coughs> um, and has talked to Attorney Rumsey about it. The question that I have, and that maybe the clerk, if she was here, could give us direction. I think she just stepped out. Here's the question that I have, Mr. President. When this item came <coughs> before us at the last council meeting, the Adams House was on it. The motion was tabled, right? It mm -hmm. was tabled in council. So now it comes back to us, but we have this tabled in council with the figures that are here, the same figures, except that this gives us all of the, um, all of, it gives us a brief explanation of what is going to be done. We know the Adams House, it was for asbestos removal. So if we're lifting it from the table, can we just vote on the whole thing? Uh, Madam Clerk, no, I don't know if you even, so, Madam Clerk, I know you, Councilor, your point of information, Councilor uh, C1. Yeah, point, just a point of information, just to answer Councilman C8's question. Um, the problem becomes is, is that they didn't C vote on it. CPC actually voted to rescind their original right. recommendation. So, um, which is why I'm, I'm suggesting we make the motion that I'm, I'm putting forward later is is that we vote for it and put it back to the CPC and allow them to because I, I mean we we can get into a legal battle whether or not it the council has the authority to do that but I, I think the courts are going to be very very conservative in terms of um you know just reviewing the cp cpa language and i, I would i would think that they're going to side on the c cpc's original recommendation that they did not vote on that or rescinded uh the project and we can't within massachusetts general law add a project to any of the funding so all right just because we did get it and it was tabled mm -hmm. so actually this is the first time that this has been before us <coughs> because it's new compared to the other and i could certainly object when it comes to a vote and it would hold everybody off until the next council meeting and i don't think that's fair for everybody else that's on here so i will go along if you make a motion uh council kadim i'll second it i will go along to let them go back and revisit that at cpc and then bring it to us but with that, I yield. I just wanted some clarification on what was tabled, and now this is new. Thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. For I'm sorry, just, and just a point of information, and that, and there's just there, there's some, I guess, legal standard. The the uh, town of Air or city of Air. I'm not sure. I think it's a town. Uh, they probably only have ten people in there. I'm uh, pretty sure. But uh, they actually ran into a similar situation with the CPC funding, and they did the exact same thing, referring it back to actually taking a vote on a project, referring it back to. CPC and allowing CPC to either reconsider up or down uh, so it didn't need to go back before them because it was already approved. However, if CPC does it decides to reject it, it's it's rejected. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of, and of course, as the council knows, and, and I know Councilor Kadim answered the question, the appropriation order that's before us 
before us tonight is what we need to act on as well. So we wouldn't be able to create an appropriation order midstream on this. Um, just for my, I guess, my own comments, but I, I, I agree with your, your, your comments, Councilor. Um, my only comments, uh, now that all the councilors have spoke, or I believe, Councilman oh, C7, do you yeah. want to speak on this? Yeah, sure. Councilman C7, Council <laughs> Pelletier. <laughs> I didn't Short see hand. you. Shorthand. Yeah. Councilman C7. In all fairness, we, we know the people involved in the Adam House, and we know that he's probably got the money to do what he has to do, but he can apply for any grants or CPA <coughs> money or whatever. But it seems to me he's being penalized, first of all, because he started early. Okay. Uh, but to say to them, well, you had money and you started ahead, and you're saying, well, uh, if you don't have the money, we'll give it to you. Well, that's not fair. He applied. I didn't say that. I did not say that. It, well, let me say, rephrase it. Uh, uh, he started with his own money. Yeah. But you rather give uh, the money to somebody that doesn't have the money to start the project. No? We're, we're, we're trying to give funds to help a project move forward. And, yeah. and the reason people apply for a project, mostly, I think, is because they don't have the money to, to do a project. Well, you know, you got a lot of uh, people. And we, we've 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 funded other projects just like his. Yeah, it, this is not the first one like this particular project. And the particular and the one is the the um, um, Alan MacCumber from um, the old Derpy Tech building. Mm -hmm. Not uh, yeah, not the Derpy Tech. Um, That's old DCC. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we 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 actually funded that one. It's the same similar. It's a housing project. Yeah. I mean, it's a similar project. We, we funded that. Well, I, I, I just feel uh, the guy started early. Uh, whether or not he's got the money to do it, he started early. Uh, you guys were going to approve it, and because of what happened, he didn't approve it. And I just don't. I just think it's it's not right. He has the right to, to ask for it. It also money sets precedent well. by by saying yes to it. It also sets precedent, and it makes us moving down the years that we have to allow all projects to start early if they feel like it. Well, you said you're going to you're going to put it now that uh, you can't start early. You didn't have that before. This guy started early, but you had no we, nothing we, saying you we, couldn't you're start right. early. It wasn't written. We had said it, but it, his his application also said that he wasn't going to start early. That's part of the process. We vetted the application that came to us saying it was going to start in July, not start in February. It was starting in July. So when you're looking at that, do you think it's going to start in July if it says July? Well, it says it's July. You think it's going to start in February? Yeah, I understand you do? that. I understand that, but but again, explain that to me, like how how that process works. When it says you're starting at a specific time yeah. and you start earlier, are we just supposed to like let that go? Well, I I just I just think it's it's just not fair. I mean, it's if unfair on our side. It's unfair. On, I agree with you on that. I'll say that, but it's unfair on <laughs> our side to put a timeline saying you're starting at a certain time and you start earlier. That's unfair too. All right. All, all in all, I, I, I think we're on the right track, and, and, and I, I really think that uh, they should have got the money. Uh, you know, uh, the, the reasons are uh, whatever you stated, and that's it. And uh, I think if we can change it, uh, I'd rather change it and say, hey, here you are. You've done a good job. You started early. Uh, next time, hey, people don't do it anymore. Don't start early. So now people know. They didn't know before. He started, but you ask him. Uh, uh, he says we're going to start in July, right? Yes. And actually, the project was almost done in July. Correct. Uh, so. So do you, think, do you think that's um, good or bad that an applicant puts in a wrong timeline? What do you think? It's it's just saying that the guy went out of his way <clears throat> to make sure the project is going to work, and he asked for funding of you guys, and because he started early, the hell with it. And that's the way I feel. I, I think he should be like everybody else. All right, so we started early, but I, I really think he should get the money that he should have got. And you're, you should make sure that it's in writing, they know it, and everything else. You probably uh, verbally told them. Had, had we known it started in February, which we didn't know, um, and looking through the application with all the questions, we would have. I. I. I shouldn't. I. I think it would have been denied because, had it already started, 
saying that the timeline was going to happen in July, I don't think it would have passed, but that's only my opinion. All right, let me ask you one question. Can you correct <coughs> this? Do you want to correct it, or you want to just leave it the way it is? I'm not going to tell the, committee, the council to do whatever they, they like. The, the council can do what they want. Mr. Kadeem is going to make a motion. This board is going to vote on that, and it will come to, back to us, and we will vote. I don't know. I'm one right, person. Well, I must, I'm one person. I'm one person. Yeah, yeah, I member. understand. There's seven votes, so I'm one well, vote. Well, so. I would like to see it go back, and then if you guys shoot it down again, well, so be again, it. Again, like personally, I was, I, I was one of the no votes because I don't think private projects should be funded. But, but the committee voted for it originally. So yeah. that's all I'll say about that. All right. I just want to make sure everything is right. And uh, if we can do it, we do it. And that's it. And mm -hmm. I know the project good, good uh, for the city. And, you know, there were we want many, to hold back 115. There, there were many other good projects we yeah. also denied. Yeah. Just saying. All right. Thank you, I yield, young man. Thank, thank you, Councilor in seat one. Councilor Lickadine. No, I, I just want to take the opportunity to thank Mr. Souza. I know. It seems like every year when you come back before us, you think it would be it would be smooth. There's always some type of issue, but <laughs> nothing's uh, ever smooth. I, yeah, I, I just hope you don't take it personal, but I, I, don't. I do want to extend my uh, gratitude to you for mm -hmm. for volunteering your time, doing what you, you're doing. You're clearly passionate about you know the use of uh, community preservation account monies and things like that. That's what we need. We may not always agree on on mm -hmm. the issues, but to have people like you on these boards to make sure that there is some type of oversight um, and, and we have that. Uh, cross opinions across the the board to, to kind of question each other and make sure that we're looking at the projects that make the most sense for uh, for the city. So um, I know some of the lines of questions get a little frustrating. I, I just don't want you to walk away here mm -hmm. um, thinking it's a it's a personal attack. So we appreciate it. We understand uh, you're one of seven, um, and I, I think you do a phenomenal job coming over here um, and actually articulating your stance, and also at the same time making sure that you're um, articulating the stance of the of the committee. So uh, kudos to you and. Thank you for coming down. I yield. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I just want to make one quick comment um, regarding this. Um, I'm going to be taking a specific exception on um, the community housing project um, that is coming before us, which is a private project. Um, I, I personally uh, don't feel that the specific outline in the scope presented to the Council or presented to CPC is something that I'm going to be in favor of specifically. Uh, that is the 77 Freedom Street project for 31000 I see $9,500 of that um, is architectural designs um, to include preparation for construction documents and providing construction administrative throughout the construction process. Um, respectfully, and I'm sure the board vetted this process, I, I, I understand that some of it uh, could be um, CPC related or preservation like related. Um, it's just not a project that uh, I'm specifically going to be supporting in any way, shape, or form based on the way it is presented. I just wanted to point that out for the record. Councilman I just want to ask Mr. Souza one question. The bioreserve land acquisition for 29.5 acres that will go to utilities and water division um, to purchase land up there. Uh, where is that land exactly? <coughs> I mean, it, it's, it's such a large area um it, it's it's uh, there's diagrams we can, if i can send you yeah. the, the um the funding application that has the actual diagrams of where in the bioreserve it is i i can't honestly even tell you right now um it's it's part of it's landlocked um so i, I we can send you that application too which has all the diagrams in it yeah i wonder if this is the 29.5 acres that's behind Mohawk Drive and up in that area and they're not just going to pay 54.9 for that it, that land must be worth more than that so the water department is going to put in the additional money and they're only asking for 54.9 from you I, I honestly can't remember to be honest if they're, they're, I believe there is some funding <coughs> that they have put into it too not as much as the 54,000 but I cannot honestly tell you exactly where Mr. it is. Mr. Right Sahadi, now. would you know? I, I don't, Counselor. Um, it's certainly, I don't believe there's anything in the operating budget, but it could be one of the capital projects that um, they have. We can check with Mr. Furlan. He's here in the building. Um, he will be down later. Um, and you can ask him at that time. Well, Mr. President, just a point of order to uh, Ms. Sahadi sits on the uh, Housing Authority if we need a member for CPC. 
With that, I yield. <laughs> she could go to the mayor and ask for an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, hearing thank no you, further counselor. Dis- <laughs> thank you. Hearing no further discussion uh, on this item from the council. Um, it is already in full council for discussion, so no uh, referral is necessary. <coughs> Mr. Sousa, thank you once again for your time. And I felt that this year may have been a little easier than last year, but... Slightly. Uh, uh, slightly. It's, not, it's all good. I mean, we argue on our board. I shouldn't say we, we discuss on our board. We do not all have the same opinion on most projects. And uh, we come together in the end. I mean, like you say, projects that I voted against, I'm still in support of now because that's what the board voted. So whether I voted for it or didn't, in the end, when it comes to the appropriation order, I'm going to go with it. Thank, and thank you. And thank you for your service. Thanks, we, we understand that it's voluntary you. and your work. Uh, <coughs> Your work never stops. So thank you very thank much you. for that, Mr. Um, next item on our agenda is a discussion of the FY2020 quarter four budget report. <coughs> this is Hottie. Um, yes, Council President. So um, each of you have um, in front of you or delivered to you the quarter four budget report. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to preference that um, it is unaudited and the city departments continue to um, make changes to it, um, final adjustments to it. So some of the information in this document actually has already changed um, from the point in time that these MUNIS reports were actually um, printed. But um, looking at the um, quarter four um, <coughs> revenue, um, you would see that we are going to have a shortfall in the revenue of about $1.4 million. The majority of that $1.4 million is spread among just a few accounts, realistically. Um, <clears throat> the motor vehicles is shorter than it came in at 98.1%. The majority of that reasoning is that the last warrant that normally goes out in the late May, early June timeframe um, didn't go out until um, July 14th as a result of the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> certainly. Um, you know that the although the there's an increase in the marijuana excise as well as the impact fee, we were unable to collect due to the governor's order to close down um, the recreational facilities for um, the months of March, April, um, and May. I believe they may have opened mid-May, um, and then we received the June receipts. In addition, um, small amounts that you're seeing in terms of, of shortfalls, the library was closed since March, so you're seeing only 60% of uh, fines and receipts. Um, um, departmental traffic was down significantly. In the recurring category, a um, couple of things. We um, budgeted $400,000 from BFI. That project um, didn't occur in fiscal 20. Um, we're currently still working with BFI to get the permitting and to be able to um, incur or, or receive those receipts in fiscal 21. Um, <clears throat> there was a push in the prior administration to potentially sell advertisement for the close circuit um, TVs that you see around the building. That didn't happen, um, so those receipts were significantly lower. And the Medicaid revenue from the school department was $487,000 less than what we had budgeted, and again, um, primarily because of the um, pandemic. Does anyone have any questions as it relates to um, the revenue aspect of the fiscal 2020 year? Revenue questions? I just have a question. Councilman C. Day, Councilor Pereira. Uh, Ms. Sada, you just talked about the 400000 for BFI. Is that for the land cover? Or it for is. Or something else? It is. So when do we anticipate that uh, being finalized? Because they're, they're permitted. Um, they're already permitted. Exactly. So and you just said um, they weren't permitted. I'm like, I thought they were permitted. Well, they're, not. they're they working. Are. Yes, so Mr. Perry is always oh, here. So he can probably answer the details of that. But we are working with them to um, a, be able to bring um, soil in to a different area right. of, of the landfill and potentially um, over a three-year period um, earn some additional revenue from that soil. Because the last time we did that was when Sutter was in office uh, and they, we were going to give them the land and cover and I objected and then talked to him and said, this is just crazy. We're going to give all this acreage of land and get nothing and then they covered, we made what, a million dollars? Approximately, that's Approximately correct. Approximately a million dollars mm -hmm. back on that. 
So um, 400,000 is, I thought we'd make maybe a million a year because it was a year, was it two years, a half? Like, I want to get as much as I can. They make a lot more money than we do. And we agree. So uh, we both agree with that. We get as much money as we can. All we right, agree. but I know. So you're, you are working on that. We are working Thank on you. it. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I, the only question I had. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions on revenue? You can continue on expenses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. Shut I don't up. see your Shut hand. Up. He can't see over that. Thing. I can't see over this. Council in C7, Council Pelletier. You can't see my belly? I can't see your hand. <laughs> Well, you know, we get all these quarterly reports, and, and, and let me tell you, it is what it is, and, and I think you do a fantastic job. Thank you. And you can pick anything you want, and, and that's what it is. It ain't going to change much. Now, the $1.4 million, uh, how do we make that up? Well, this particular year, we have surpluses or turnbacks, as they're referred to, on the expense side. So the turnbacks on the expense side are actually greater than the shortfall on the revenue side. So we will still end up with a positive impact on free cash for fiscal 20. So it's a, a fair year, it's a good year. It's, it's a good year. It's a reasonable year. year. Right? It would have been a better year if we had the revenues. All right, yeah. well, I think you do a fantastic yeah. job and thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor in seat two, Councillor Dion. I'm gonna, uh, um, so what is the dollar amount on the turnbacks? Um, again, Councillor, <coughs> um, as I indicated a second ago, um, these are unaudited, so the turnbacks are continuing to um, be looked at on a regular basis in terms of whether there's open encumbrances, whether there's accounts payables that need to be recorded. Um, this document alone has changed since the MUNIS report was printed. Um, for an example, if you look at the school department in particular, in this particular document itself that was printed on, this is how, how often this is changing at this point, was printed on 8-3. Um, if you looked at school operations, it, it indicates that there's 500 and I think it's 40 some odd thousand dollars um, excess. And as of today, that's zero, 534. So as of 8-3, which was just a week ago, um, there were 534. <coughs> so Mr. Almeida is still making year-end entries um, to um, close out his fiscal year. So in order to tell you what the specific turnbacks are, what you're seeing here in this particular document, if you look at the column <coughs> that has the um, Percentage use, let me just get to it for you. <clears throat> the actual, if you look at the total available and the actual amount right now, you'll see basically that any department that has um, less than 100% utilized in the percent utilized column, that would be the percent, or that would be the dollar value of the turn back in that particular department. Right. So, but we're but we're uh, to be confident that our turnbacks are going to exceed our shortfall, but yet we have no comparison at this time because everything's changing on a daily basis. Well, I wouldn't say changing on the daily basis. This this document is it was prepared on eight three um, for your use. We have theoretically until September thirty to close out the books and have free cash certified by the Department of Revenue. Um, I don't expect any particular department um, within city government, um, primarily with ex the exception of school, that has a significant amount of turn, turn back in this doc document, right, the 534,000. I don't expect any other departments to be coming forth with um, purchase orders that they haven't cut or expenses that they need to record. Um, so I think the remaining de departments within this document are, are pretty, pretty solid in terms of the turnbacks. Okay, thank you. With that, I yield. Thank you, Councilor on seat five, Councilor Lee. Just to continue with the summarizing of the $1.4 million shortfall, uh, based on the fact that we've been relatively conservative on our expenditures, <laughs> It's not going to have a negative impact on us. That is correct. We will have a we'll have a positive turn back on the expense side. And <clears throat> throughout this process, throughout the past seven months, we've had conversations about expenses. Um, but that right now, as of right now, there's no there's no mechanism in place that we could, as a council, as a body, or even an, as a, as a public, uh, see the exact you know receipts of each expenditure in each department. Correct. 
You mean the who the vendor has been paid? Yeah, you, um, you know how we've we've had multiple right. conversations about right. bills so, being paid and exactly. And so if you things. wanted to see, so you you have in your document um, the expenses by category, um, but I'll just I just flipped it open. Um, City Council. Oh, since that's, council. A, that's yeah. a great one, yeah. City Council. Um, this past year, you spent $108,000, $671 in audit fees. Right. Um, you would have to come to the audit department, you know, city auditor, and ask them to drill down the details of that particular line item mm -hmm. by vendor. And um, that's just for one example. For, that's for one example. Right? Um, we looked at it after. Um, you had that conversation with me this past week with the city auditor, yep. and it's well over a thousand pages worth of <laughs> of documents, and that's excluding school. So if we yeah. drill down just the city expenditures, um, it's a significant report. And, and this is just my question. My line of question has always been based on the fact that you know we have multiple thousands and probably even more uh, taxpayers mm -hmm. in the city that never get a chance to see the details of, of how government expense, you know, occurs or all, you know, all the expenses that, that occur. So we had a subcommittee not too long ago. I don't think it's really active anymore. I don't even think it's in, in place anymore. Um, that was supposed to sort of be like act as an oversight of, of department expenditures, correct? Am I wrong on that? Uh, it was an audit um, yeah. subcommittee. Yeah. Mr. Kadeen, you were on that subcommittee. <laughs> what was the name of it? Budget prep and audit. Thank you, thank okay. you, Council President. We abolished it. Yeah, and Boy, and yeah. I think I think maybe in the future what what we could possibly have. Well, I mean even this bo even this body um, as a as a finance committee could possibly do that. But I think if we really did want to break out those books or look at those kind of expenditures, um, it might be beneficial in the future be so that taxpayers can see the extent of of how money is ex expended uh, per department. So with that, I yield. Thank you. Any further questions on, on revenue? Hearing none. Expenses? <coughs> questions on expenses? Councilor in C2, Councilor Dion. Um, I'd like to uh, address solid waste um, specifically. At our last meeting, um, we had a transfer for four hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars, I'm I'm a little confused to date because it started off as a missed payment. It changed to a. It went off track in 2017. But from some documentation that you gave me, um, this to me shows that. In 2017, there were actually 12 payments that were made. So no payment was missed in 2017. And that, well, that's actually the fiscal year 2017. And then in fiscal year 2018, 10 payments were made. Right, Councillor. So I, I had indicated it was 17. I, I believed it was 17 at the time. It was actually the 17 18 year, the May and the June payment for fiscal 18 was paid on July 23rd, 2018. So it was paid 23 days late in terms of the fiscal year. <clears throat> so it was charged to the next fiscal year's budget when the expenditure was paid to the vendor. So point, point of information, I'm Johnson sorry. Seat one. When Pardon you say me. that, was there an encumbrance made or was it just there no, was no that encumbrance? was the problem. And we were between um, DCM directors. Um, Mr. Perry was yeah, being I, paid yeah, service out of rank, to, but there was no encumbrance. So there could have been. Yeah. And there was actually a <coughs> turn back that year. So to um, Councilor Lee's point, he asked, did that particular department have a turn back? Well, they did. And it actually exceeded what that payment would have been. So the May 2018 and the June 2018 payments that were made in July would count as one payment or two payments? Well, they're for two different months' bills. So I'll say two payments. Okay. And then we made 10. So in reality, did we make 
12 payments or 13 payments in fiscal year 2019? In 19, I believe there were 13 payments. <clears throat> so, if those, so if that was caught up in fiscal year 2019, what were we catching up in fiscal year 21 making the extra payment this year? So in 2018, there were 10 payments. May and June was made in 2000, I'm so confused, 2019. Me too. <laughs> Did I? Thank you. I didn't bring mine with me. So in the 2018 year, 10 payments were made because payment 11 for the month of May and payment 12 was made in the next fiscal year. So payment 11 and 12 were both made on set in the warrant, the AP warrant 723.18. So those two invoices got made in fiscal 19. Okay, so do avoid confusion because it's very easy to lose confusion here. Um, the documentation that you provided, Mrs. Sahadi, you indicated that there was, let's start with 17, there was 12 payments made in 2017. That's correct. There were 10 payments paid in FY18. That's correct. And 13 payments in FY19. That's correct. And now 13 payments again in FY20. And that's because the June payment, the June invoice from Republic Services, again, was paid in July of 2019. So in that particular case, on 722, the June invoice, actually two invoices at that particular time, because it, in that year we were actually being billed twice a month. Um, the invoice for 74,951 and the invoice for 75,855 were both paid on July 22nd, 2019, even though they represented the June services. And again, as Councilor Kadeem just pointed out, they were not encumbered. So this year, um, the gentleman, I believe his name is Chris from Republic, um, faxed over the invoice to Mr. Perry so that we could make sure that we were paying all of the invoices in the right year. And there lies the transfer that we asked for, particularly because we had a number of departments this year with <coughs> surpluses or turnbacks because business wasn't business as usual in government since March to April, or March to June. So we have a number of departments with turnbacks, so it was appropriate to pay the invoice since it was a June invoice in the first place and pay it during fiscal year 2020. Uh, I, 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 I gotta interrupt you for a moment. So he, while I acknowledge that, um, and, and I know we've had these discussions, Mrs. Sahadi, in the past regarding this specific item because councilors took exception to some of the representations that were made at our last meeting with respect that we didn't know where it came from. We don't know if it was 2017. I recall specifically somebody went on the radio and said, listen, we're not sure. Uh, it was a joke, 2017. We don't know what, we, we just didn't know when it happened. It was after, the, after our meeting where we found out and we recognized that there were some specific items that uh, we found out after the city council made the vote in the transfer. So there well, was there was different. Just just so we're clear, so we don't we don't go out of line here and get frustrated when we don't need to be. <coughs> came down to the council. We didn't know where the payment was. It was after the meeting that we found out after Councilor Dion requested the additional information to find out when the payment was and what kind of analysis was done. So the analysis most likely, and I'm sure we going forward will make this uh, a priority, should have probably been done before the transfer came down. Instead of making representations that there were, we don't know where it came from or, or what year it was, right? So. Well, can I just, because I did make that comment, Councilor, and I, I still stand by the fact that the question was how, how or, or why did it happen? And I can't answer that even today. I don't know whether Republic sent the invoice in late and so it didn't get processed timely. I don't know whether it sat in the mailroom. I don't know whether it sat on Mr. Perry's <laughs> desk 
I don't know why and, and I, it didn't I, get paid and I, and in the fiscal year. I, and I get that, but I just want you to know, you didn't go on the radio. The mayor said- I did not, correct. On 2000, in 2007, w w this goes all the way back to possibly 2017. We didn't know, and there were representations that were made that we didn't know. We now found out, which is okay, we're aware of what happened. We still don't know what year is what because it, it's confusing the way it wasn't encumbered. But I just want to make it clear. I think going forward next time, and I think you acknowledge this, that before we make representations to the council on these specific items, that we do the analysis first and then send the transfer down because it would have eliminated a lot of this confusion and a lot of some council frustration that we've had to deal with over the last couple of weeks. And, and, I, and I think you acknowledge that, right? Yeah. And, 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 and if I can just add to that first, um, yes, because in our last conversation, in our last meeting, um, it, it was stated that in 2017 we went off track, only made 11 payments and stayed off track for a time mm -hmm. and then realized we were off track and now we were setting things straight. But the reality is in 2017 we made 12 payments. We weren't off track and we weren't behind. So I think mm -hmm. that also contributed to the confusion and people wondering, okay, what, you know, what exactly, how did we go off track? Did we unintentionally because obviously I would I would would never assume it would be an intentional uh, yeah, missing of a payment or not paying an obligation yeah. right certainly and and I mean at the end of the day the responsibility falls to me so whether there was a lot of flux in the department at that point or not I was sitting in that chair at that point um, the bills lag with Republic due to the fact that um, July is a month of July we need to close out I mean June I'm sorry June is the month of June, and it, we have to close out our fiscal year, uh, you know, June 30th. So um, we need to get that bill at a prompt time. Um, the May and June bill this year, I actually had to fish for from Republic and, and request that they send it to make sure we get paid. Uh, it got paid. The responsibility falls on me. Um, the messages that were conveyed, uh, although Mrs. Sahadi and I were on the same page as far as what we were thinking, I can I can certainly understand how it got convoluted and confusing to everybody involved. You have fiscal years, you have actual years, um, and, and that was difficult to follow. Um, the, the, the fact remains now we are on track with Republic, um, and this, this slip up as far as the, the, the payments being made in a timely manner aren't going to happen again. Um, I'm, I'm going to assure that. Um, and make sure, but at the end of the day, this isn't Mrs. Sahadi's responsibility, isn't it the mayor's responsibility. This was my responsibility to make sure that happened, uh, and I'm not going to skirt that. Uh, so I apologize for the confusion. Um, there wasn't an extra payment made. There was no lost payment. No money has disappeared. Right. Any of, none of that has taken place. <coughs> I know that's, that's been insinuated in certain circles. Um, a lot of things have been. And Mr. Perry, we acknowledge also that there was a flux in that yep. department. There was some, you know, Certainly. people moving in and out of there. Different. We recognize right. under the prior administration things were kind of unorganized, and we we get that. I, I just want to make. I respect your position. I respect the responsibility. I'm sure the council does. We just want to make sure that if we have a transfer coming before the council, and I know it's acknowledged and respected, that we'll do the analysis first. Absolutely. So if councilors have questions, we're not going backwards. And and. L lesson learned. Can that's, certainly that's, understand that's that train of thought. We'll, we'll move forward on that. Absolutely. So moving forward, we'll, are we <clears throat> going to be making 12 payments each and every year, and our final payment will be in June for the June payment? Absolutely. Or that's the track we're going to be on? Absolutely. There aren't going to be Council. any payments in the next fiscal year to complete the prior year. We're just going to stay on track with 12 payments each and every year. That, that's the that's intent intention. with each and every line item, Councilor, to make sure that all of our, our, our requisitions and, and, and um, expenditures are done at the end of June so Mrs. Saadi and the auditor's office can do their year event close up. Now, I know um, that transfer was 330000 at that last meeting. In the third quarter, we had had a $150,000 transfer so I'm assuming this 480 is those two dollar amounts. Um, I'm sorry, I should be telling you what page I'm on, shouldn't I? Be page 20 under expenses, under solid waste. Uh, yes, that would be the combination of the two transfers that were um, voted into um, disposal. Okay, so and then there's a transfer under recycling for 264,000. Can you explain that one? Because I'm, I'm not clear on what that is. 
So, and I would have to go back and, and review um, the details of this, but that particular column includes both encumbrances from the prior year as well as transfers. So that may not have been um, a transfer because I don't recall a transfer into that line. So that was probably an encumbrance that was um, carried forward. But again, I would have to confirm. Yeah, that. I don't remember seeing another transfer. I only remember seeing the 150 and then obviously the 330 from the last month. That's why I was a little confused. So what, so what would we encumber from one year to the other in the recycling? Uh, an invoice. An invoice. The final invoice. The final Correct. invoice, right. Okay. And we may not have had the final invoice, but we had an estimate of what the amount would have been. So if it's encumbered, Counselor, that, that is what we're going to have to pay. So that basically accounts for that money that's going to be spent after July 1, but it's been encumbered already, <coughs> so the process is being followed correctly. Right, as long as it's encumbered. Correct. Correct. Um, well, with that, I'll yield for now. Thank you, Counselor. In seat one, Counselor Kadeem. Uh, <coughs> just a question, because Counselor in seat two just asked it with with the encumbrance, so I don't have that document in front of me, so I had heard that it was 13 payments of, is it 13 payments for? So if we if we had 13 payments, what fiscal year? Uh, 20. Okay. Right, so if we had 13 payments, but we had an encumbrance, so we didn't really so the encumbrance has taken the money from the prior fiscal year, rolling it over. So all we really did was just pay the total invoices. We would have been short, right? Because you have 150,000 coming in from FY 19 to 20 to pay for an invoice. Are True. you following me? So, I am. So, so I think we're confusing I, I disposal and recycling now, though, because I believe what was encumbered, and Most I'd have to go recycling. back and look at the details, but I believe what was encumbered 19 into 20 was recycling invoices, not disposal. I believe invoices. that's correct, Council. And what we're talking about here is disposal invo invoices specific to the Republic billing. But the, docu but the document that we have. That is just disposal. That's okay. So if I'm looking at FY20, you've got the first payment, right? So if you take the first line item, 79, I mean 74951 and the 75855, yep. that comes to the yep. 1580640. That ties out to the exact number on the quarter two report. I don't have quarter one, so I'm, a, I'm just <coughs> trying to figure out if it was an encumbrance. So. That ties out to the encumbrance, so you essentially rolled over FY19 monies to cover that payment. So if I if I reduce that, if I say that we've already reallocated the money from 19 for costs to pay for the trash, mm -hmm. for solid waste, using FY19 monies, I take that off the table, we only have 12 payments. That would be correct. If you were looking at that, that account in a vacuum, but when we're looking at the transfers and we're working with the city auditor, um, I believe the other issue is the recycling. And I would have to, to, to council president's point, I would have to go back and analyze all of the solid waste accounts in order to be able to determine if the amounts that were carried forward were for recycling or disposal, or for that matter, even for collection. So I, I, at the end of the day, I mean. So at the end of the day, we're looking at the solid waste department in, in its total. So it would have been short, regardless of which account we're talking about, it would have been short the, the amount that we needed for the transfer. Um, was it classified incorrectly when we spoke to you initially? It may have been, mm -hmm. um, because looking at it now, based on the department, I'm thinking you have the same potential issue with recycling, and both accounts um, were significantly more than that was budgeted in the prior year, and so as a result, a transfer was needed into that department to make it whole. Yeah. So, I, I think, you know, the council president really kind of summarized, I, I think, what the overall issue is with, with the council, right? So originally we, we get notification that we're going to make an extra payment. We need a transfer because we need to make an extra payment to catch up on something. And then the, the question specifically I asked was why are we doing that? Because we have funds that run into the 
prior, prior next, yep. to the next year all the time, whether it's electrical or gas or whatever. So it's and, and from from an outside order standpoint, it's immaterial because you're getting the 12 payments in that in a year, given year, right? That's so correct. we were told that it was at least I was told on, on the briefing, and I, I believe it was Mr. Perry mm -hmm. that stated it that it was due to you know just to make sure that when we ask for analysis on trash that we can have it, right? And I think at that time I said to me it doesn't make any sense because if you take you know, the payments that you have in one year, eliminate the July payment and take on the following year's payment, you get that analysis. So whatever the case was, it was I, w I wasn't trying to make a, a big stink about it. But then it comes back to that we're trying to catch up. And I think when you look at this, it just doesn't make sense because if we, and I'm just looking at solid waste and that's all I thought we, we were talking about was the solid waste piece. The first payment is paid for through an encumbrance. So for prior year, invoices then you've got 11 uh, I guess 11 payments and that are covering so we come back to the to the council to cover if we if we had not had that encumbrance we would have been we would have been short and if it's just the fact that we didn't catch the bills that's that's one thing or tonnages the tonnage was up I think that's the the conversation that needs to be had with us that I, I think that's the sticking point. Is, is when we when we come down to the council, we just need to know what the real reason is. I don't know that anybody has a real particular distaste for making a transfer because tonnage is up, right? Or you know, at the end of the day, it's the bills are coming in higher than we anticipated. Whatever the case may be, I think those are the conversations that need to be had. Um, you know, when we go back and forth and all, all this, it just it logically doesn't make any sense. You know, and and I don't know that it's worth, especially when we're going into a fiscal year, you know, 21 and 22, where financially we're, we're going to have some difficulties that we really want to catch up on payments to make sure that we capture them all in the fiscal year when it really doesn't serve us any purpose other than the fact that, you know, you're getting all the fiscal year bills in, in one year. But, I mean, you've got other categories where you constantly see that taking place anyway. So that's just my take. Um, you know, it, Again, it still doesn't make any sense when I'm looking at it, unless you're telling me it's the recycling, which I don't have the analysis on the recycling. But <coughs> and, and, and Councilor, I, I certainly agree with you, um, and I don't either. I'm just looking at, you know, the Munis report that was run on 8-3, and we had transfers and adjustments for recycling of 264. We had the transfers in, and um, <coughs> encumbrances for disposal of 480, and then some small amount um, in the. Um, bag account. Mm -hmm. So at this particular point, in order for me to really go back and analyze all of the expenses within solid waste to better be able to answer the question, mm -hmm. I would have to do that. Um, so I, I just think in the in the future, just from my standpoint, I, both of you know where I come from anyway, so mm -hmm. uh, I don't have an issue telling you if I disagree with something or not in, in the meetings. My, my only concern is, is that when we have these transfer conversations and briefings we're told something and we, we haven't necessarily gotten the full analysis on it or we're not sure so I, my, my only recommendation is before we get presented with something just make sure that we've got the full analysis so that you know nobody's coming back saying well we were told this it's something different we thought we had well, it we, you know we what I'm so mr perry and i certainly <coughs> apologize um when we first looked at the account it certainly appeared that it was disposal um i didn't really go into the details of all of the other accounts to determine that it may have been um, recycling as opposed to, or some combination thereof. <coughs> but at the end of the day, we were trying to, um, and we knew those Republic bills were not, had not been received. And so we were trying to make, bring those into the right accounting period. And yep. you are correct, gas and electric often um, cover multiple years, but in this particular case, because recycling and disposal has been such a hot topic and the cost of both have increased so significantly and there has been, you know, the will of this council to really know what we are spending on those areas, we thought it was important to um, analyze them. And so, you know, my apologies for not analyzing recycling at the same time. It's also an $800,000 um, budgeted item mm -hmm. um, and this past year we spent a million dollars so it's also an area that um, needs our, or has our concern as, a, as it relates to the cost of, of just removing both recycling and and solid waste. So my issue is the only issue I take with the statement that you made is, is the analysis piece right because it is a hot button topic I, I still don't understand that we needed to make 13 payments to get a true analysis of where we are right so 
just for instance, any one of these counselors say, hey, give me, give me an analysis on what the trash cost was last year. What you're going to do is you're going to go take, you're going to take a snapshot, go back to the actuals for FY20. You eliminate the first payment in July, and then you go into this fiscal year, you take that July payment and you put it in, right? So, so then you've got a true analysis. So I don't know that from a financial standpoint, upfronting the money in a helps. Good, in helps. A good, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, it just doesn't help. The, it's the analysis piece. In a good is, year, you're right. Not, but look at the years. We had two years where May and June was paid in the next fiscal year. So mm -hmm. we were just trying to look at, it's a big bill on a, on a regular basis. And so we were really trying to look at it. One, to make sure that, quite frankly, that the 21 budget makes sense. And, you know, when were these bills paid? Because as, as Mr. Perry indicated, we don't often get the bills even as timely yep. as we'd like them. And so um, we paid May and June in July yeah. in one year. So and Listen, I, I don't disagree. We, should, we shouldn't have to be chasing allied ways to, yep. uh, I mean, Republic Service, whatever they're, they're called now, to, to give us invoices. But we often have to do that. You know, we, we, we do that with other vendors. It's frustrating, so mm -hmm. I agree with that. However, I, I think what the more important conversation that needs to be had, and I think this kind of takes away from it, is just the cost of you know trash. That that's yeah. the conversation that we really need to have, and what are we doing to minimize the the cost coming in? Um, that that really is what we should be talking about. But I think when we have you know, and I say misrepresentations, I don't I don't know that's the probably the best way to describe it. But when we have these misrepresentations, I, I think we get distracted and we get focused on these items versus talking about what the, the real issues are. So, you know, just, just in the future from my standpoint, I mean, if we, we could just do a little bit better job, I understand everybody is, is working, you know, as hard as they can with uh, less resources. Um, but just before we, you know, present things to the council, it's, you know, just as accurate as, as possible. That's all. We will try. All right, I yield, Ms. President. Thank you, Councilman CDA, Councilor Pereira. Yeah, what I don't understand is if bills weren't paid, then Mr. Perry had to have extra in his account. He did in that particular. So where did that extra go? Free cash. Yes. So instead of paying bills, we went to free cash. But it wasn't it intentional. Up the free cash and looks good in an election year. I'm but disgusted. With that, I yield. May I respond With to that, that Council? You can speak on it. Uh, Councilor Pereira, I, I take exception to that. That I possibly might have not paid a bill to make somebody look good. I don't think good. you didn't pay the bill. Um, but I think that there's auditors here that know it. And in 2017, prior to you getting there. You had two other people there, so it wasn't even with you, Mr. Perry. I know you're sitting there and you're taking the blame, and I can appreciate that for anything, but you had the, the gentleman from Rhode Island that worked here for a while. Um, you had the other gentleman that came <coughs> from the Water Department and was there. And prior to that, um, before all of this trash uh, privatization, et cetera, that we did, we had Mr. Pacheco there, and there wasn't a problem. I just find you got to know, <clears throat> auditor's office, you, Mary, somebody's got to know, you know, I have a mortgage payment to make. I know I got to make one every month. So oh. if you know you didn't have that payment, how would you have this extra money, Mr. Perry? So I, I just, I mean, regardless, and, and I'm not defending any administration or, or not, what I'm going to say is just from the heart as far as I understand the flux in the department, there were other people. Um, Correct. At that point, though, when these mistakes and these errors were made, I was in that seat. Um, and Mrs. Sahadi and, and counselors, yourself as a group, expect us as directors to be able to make sure that the information that we're conveying to them is accurate. Sure, there is an, an auditing process, and it could have been caught. Um, but at the end of the day, the responsibility lies with me to make sure those payments are made. I think that the um, responsibility lies with a number of people. So. You being one, Mr. Perry, Mr. Certainly. Sahadi being one, the auditor being another one, and we do have audits that come in every year that are done. That should have been picked up somewhere. And I think that's what frustrates the people of the city when things like this happen and all of a sudden it's like, oh, we really don't know how this happened. We paid this. They sent the bill late. And it's excuses. People in Fall River, I. They're tired of excuses. It's like, you know, people need to coordinate and maybe just do a better job. And I agree with what Council Kadeem said. I know that we don't have enough individuals working in certain departments as we should. I'll be the first to admit that. I look at the planning department. You know, you look at New Bedford and they're, they're building things, they're moving things, they're getting done. Well, they've got six or seven people in their planning department. You have Mr. Kenny and Brittany. What do you expect? 
And you know, we, we need a city engineer. Are we gonna get one? Well, are we gonna be able to pay somebody? Because our last engineer, like him, not like him, whatever, he left to get $20,000 a, uh, a year more. If you want, you know, to get people to come to Fall River and to really work hard, you gotta pay people too. I get that, and it's hard for the general public to understand that these things cost money. People that have expertise in certain departments cost money, I get that. And it's hard to explain that to people. And then they become frustrated when they hear something like this. I mean, if I know that I have extra money in my checking account, and I know what my bills are, I have to say to myself, how the hell do I have $500 extra in my checking account? Something's not right. Something's not right. But then I'm just gonna put that into my <coughs> savings account and say, well, forget about it, but my savings account will look good. I can't do that either, because you gotta pay your bills first. I'm sorry, I just, you know, I did put in a resolution today about doing something <coughs> with Suzanne Bump on trash and, and healthcare. Two of the biggest pockets that we hit in the budget, two of the biggest areas that there's problems. And we've got to do something else. Doing the same thing over and over again has not gotten us ahead. It's been administration after administration after administration. Some a little worse than others. I mean, the last one was a real corker, but <laughs> you know, but, but you have to do these things. And the public has to see that we have to do things. Trash is a phenomenal amount of money. And I've got to say that as a director, I can call Mr. Perry anytime there's a problem, he's always there to help. So I respect him and I think he's a really hard worker. But I'm just telling you what we as counselors here after from the public and that, you know, we're supposed to be here advocating for them. And then they call and they're like, I can't believe what's this. What? You know, it's, it's hard. And you probably need more help too. You know, and we probably need a city administrator too. And we do need somebody on the PCP from the Housing Authority. Maybe you could put on another hat. So yeah, there's could. lots that we need and we're just stretching people out as much as we can stretch them. And it's just not fair. I mean, even, even the ladies in the council office getting all this paperwork ready for all of us. I thought computers were gonna save trees. I guess not. I mean, everybody's working hard. I get that. I do get it. But we have to start doing things a little different. And there needs to be, you know, a sense of accountability all over the place. And people working together, connecting together. It's not just John, it's not just it's not just Mr. Perry, it's not just Mrs. Sahadi, it's not just the city auditor. It's everybody collaborating and working together to get through this. With that I yield, thank you. Council in seat five, council LA. So mistakes are not are not is not a, an uncommon thing in government, right? We see it all the time. We see it in the private sector, and we see it in government all the time. So what's rare, though, is that people come up and they step up and they take responsibility for it. So I, I'm i not here. I know that it's hard to sit in that seat when these questions come down the line. And I just I just know that as far as John Perry goes, I, wouldn't rather, I would rather work with John Perry on all these things than anyone else. Uh, when it comes to these problems that come down the line, and when you when I have a problem, when a constituent comes to me, you're the first person I reach out to, um, and and you're always there, you're always on top of it. So I feel the need to say that now because I know that you're feeling a lot of heat right now from no. you know some of these things or some heat at least from some of these things. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you understood that like we're not trying to drop hammers on people and we're not we're not trying to insult you or anything like that, but obviously mistakes were made and and it's not. It's not uncommon, but to take responsibility and to step up and just say, hey, it falls on me, I'm, and, and to try to rectify the situation, it's really important to see that. I think people who are out there re watching this need to see that as well, that we're not trying to, it was, it was conveyed, just to, just to, to point, uh, Council President's point, it was conveyed that we didn't care, the, the city council didn't care about, quote, missing money from, the, you know, from that transfer. And that's just not true. I mean, we, you know, you know more than anyone that we care about this because we've bombarded multiple times offline about about some of these things. Um, even me, I have another question just to follow up on uh, a question that I asked regarding um, 
and this was something that I believe Council Pereira brought up years ago in Council. I know for a fact Council Mayoza uh, brought it up years ago um, about the recycling bins at the some of the housing areas. That's been rectified, correct? They are still there, but I'm working with Mr. McCoy over in the Housing Authority to, to come up with a plan as to whether they are going to pay a fee to us to continue sure. to collect it or if we're going to take those out of there and, and they are going to... Um, take care of it themselves. Now, is there a specific number of barrels? I think it's 54 or 57, Counselor. So I believe. There I so believe there that don't, somewhere don't around 54 that. or 50. It's so. in that area. Anywhere from 55 to 60. Let's and say. this was since probably around 2016-ish? I'd say <coughs> maybe even before that. Okay. So we don't know exactly how what, what dollar amount mm -hmm. we've kind of expended on this in, in this situation. But f going forward, we're going to try to rectify the situation right. the best we can. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. We're so also I, looking at, I'm sorry. <coughs> no, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I appreciate your kind words, but I also <clears throat> understand, look, you know what? We all make mistakes, as you said, but we need to continue to learn. Once you stop continuing to learn and you think you know everything, you become stagnant, and that's when problems really happen. So the council president's point, as far as the analysis being done prior to us coming down here, and giving you information. I pride myself in the fact that I try to come down here and make sure I convey accurate yeah. information to all of you. Uh, it's never an attempt to be misleading. And to Councilor in seat one's uh, point about the um, uh, accurate picture of what we're dealing with, you know, my my financial acumen doesn't reach the level, obviously, of Mr. Kadeem or Councilor Kadeem or Mrs. Sahadi. Um, and again, I learn from them all the time. Uh, so listening to his statements, I can see why he would say that might not make sense. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of that, okay, the light bulb goes off, and I see, I see what you mean. Um, and you learn from that, uh, and we'll continue to do better as we go forward. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate what you said, um, and, and I thank and we you. still have to chip away. I mean, we have, we have an upcoming um, subcommittee meeting where we're going to try to mm -hmm. talk that, that subject that Council of Seat 1 talked about, about what can we do, what, what are our options out there to try to reduce or at least mitigate some of the costs that are coming down the line without such a burden on the taxpayer at the same time, which is a very difficult task to do. Um, <clears throat> but, I, but I think things like this, things like these conversations do help because now we were able to recoup some funds for I mean even if you feel or even if it's felt that it's not a lot of money it's still some um, that's come that's come down the line from something that was overlooked for, for quite some time and this was bef that was way before you were there when we put the bins there yeah I, I was with the department but yeah. under the tutelage of Mr. Pacheco right so I mean I think that's something that you know we can if maybe we can keep on unturning some of these stones mm -hmm. we can we can find some some more uh, ways to to take the burden off the taxpayer in that way yeah, and uh, we do with that I as as yep. um, Councilor Pereira said, we do take everything that each of you say seriously, and we go back and try <laughs> to work on um, making changes within what we have. Um, Councilor Dion's commented about picking up trash for the businesses, and yes. we've looked at what that cost is, what that tonnage is. About 400000 or so? Or um, that would include the six families in greater, so yep. we have been working on those analysis and then Every we counts, may right? be down with <clears throat> a change in that as well. But yep. those are the kind of things we welcome all of your ideas. Yep. Um, we're only two people here when we're talking about trash. Um, and we're only you know, as good as the community. I mean, I, I when when we had that discussion, when we had that discussion from the blue bins at the, at the housing place, I got uh, pictures you know, mm -hmm. sent to me, and then I sent them immediately to you. Yep. And you know, social media people on social media yeah. were, were getting involved in the yeah. conversation. We're, it's as a community, you know, it's not just it's not just us, and it's not just us at this table. It's also the people out there mm -hmm. that are seeing these things and reporting it back to us, and we can then figure out a way to try to make things better. So, sure. um, you know, it's a, it's a community based type thing too, as well. So. Agree. Thank you, Councillor. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor in seat seven, Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. Do they bill you the first of the month for the month or the last of the month for that particular month? <coughs> it's at the end of the month that we get billed for the particular month, Councilor. Some months we'll get two bills. i um, not quite sure why they do that, but sometimes it'll be broken up into two bills. And we'll get one around the 15th or the 18th of the month, and then we'll get one at the end. Um, but it, it's basically you get your bill at the end of the month for the tonnages that have been received at the transfer station. So you, you could have got the bill uh, June 30th? Correct. I could mean, have that, 
that's pretty short notice, to be honest with you. Understood. But as you, you want to close out the books, mm -hmm. and you're just getting it the 30th. Mm -hmm. So I could see the oversight, I guess. And is a payment missing? Well, if there's a payment missing, you would know, we know, Mary knows, everybody knows that we got to pay it, and which you did pay. But the part that was a 270? Um, the the two invoices, um, yeah, two, well, 236, I think. Well, what was the payment made? Um, July 23rd. And so For that's the other issue. DOR allows us to have a warrants payable. The last yeah. warrant that gets allowed yeah. is July 15th. So it could have potentially been paid on the July 15th warrant, but yeah. it was not. So the so airline it, 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 it went back to, to free cash, right? Yeah. Correct. So that's it goes correct. back to free cash. Now we find out that we missed the payment. So uh, to me, I mean, you know, hanky panky, it, 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 it went to free cash. We paid it. To me, I, I mean, we can look at it all day long. I don't think anybody done anything wrong. Or, uh, you know, the money went in the wrong pocket. As far as, far as I'm concerned, so uh, you know, we talked about this for an hour, and uh, you know, I mean, we talk about it for two more hours. But the fact is that it's paid. The fact is that the money went into free cash, and until she uh, looks into it a little more, I think things are all right. So I have, I have no problem with that whatsoever. Appreciate so, that, uh, Council. We'll, we'll take it from that. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Council on C2, Council Dion. Yeah, um, I was going to wait until, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or not, I was going to wait until the resolutions about the trash, et cetera, were discussed later on this evening. But with uh, Councilor in seat five commenting on the um, blue recycle bins in the, in the um, housing. housing developments, um, I guess we were discussing expenses and we're discussing the trash. Um, I would just like to comment that I b and I've said it all along that I believe there are savings to be had. There are, ex there are revenues to be made. And I think that our, um, our whole trash program, I think it, it, it needs to be exam thoroughly examined, honestly looked at, and hopefully we can get on a, on a good track and make everything better um, for everyone involved. Well, so with that, I'm only gonna touch on a couple of things. Um, in city ordinance, <coughs> The city supplied wheeled trash receptor. Blue and pink carts are solely used for recycling and green carts for household trash. Uh, any dwelling, house, building, or other structure designed or used either wholly or in part for private residential purposes, whether inhabited or temporarily or continuously uninhabited or vacant, and shall include any yard, grounds, walk, etc. Specifically, obviously, residential. So now we went to this easy disposal um, contract and acceptable waste means all household including occasional non-hazardous in mixed commercial and non-hazardous municipal waste of the type currently generated or present within the corporate boundaries of the city of fall river um again it, it references residential and over here it says Res residential collection and hall the curbside collection of acceptable waste generated by the households including limited business customers set forth in Exhibit H. In the easy disposal contract, there were 70 businesses that were designated to be picked up as Exhibit H, which actually excluded other businesses. Um, some businesses who had opted in when there used to be a $120 household fee, I believe, that they paid so that their trash could be picked up but I think the problem is we just have so many moving parts. We have an ordinance that says it's residential. We have a, dis a contract that says it's residential, um, but yet we're doing an all-encompassing trash collection. I think that's something that needs to be addressed, and I'm not saying that people should be excluded. Maybe we can find an equitable way that's equitable for the city, the businesses, and the residents to bring everything together and, and, and make things function uh, better. As far as the blue carts in, in the um, housing development, I know that there's 17 carts at Doolin, there are six at Oak Village. I don't, know, I don't know how many are at the other location, but this subject came up a month ago. And a month ago, I don't know if the question was misunderstood 
or I, uh, or what we were told that the carts already had been removed, which obviously we know they haven't. Um, and I just think that in a month we should have gotten a little further. And uh, how long do you think it will take to make it definitive? You know, what, what, because it seems from what I understand, it technically could be as easy as just a phone call. You know, the city, we're not supposed to be picking up the recycling. You're supposed to be taking care of your own recyclables. Um, it's on the, t the, the backs of the taxpayers, and we need to resolve this. Okay, I mean, that, that can actually be resolved uh, quite easily, I would say. Um, you know, a month, if to you a month is, is too long for that particular item to be, uh, have been handled, I'll make sure that I put the press on to get it taken care of ASAP. Uh, there are, are a number of other things that do play a part, um, and I would, I, would, I would, as Councilor in seat 5 said, every penny counts, and I understand that. Uh, taxpayers are stressed, and I understand that. Um, but I think in the grand scheme of things, um, with our trash issues, um, disposal issues, financial issues when it comes to that, um, I think those 62 or 60 or 55 carts that are at the Housing Authority are probably the most minimal of the issues we have. I think what you just touched on as far as business collection is probably a much bigger issue. Uh, as Mr. Sahadi had mentioned, we began the analysis to see what our possible savings could be if that was eliminated. Um, six family tenements, um, that analysis has been started, and, and, and we've actually, I guess there's been some discussion with five tenement families as well, because basically, if you really think about it, anything over a four is, is supposed to be considered commercial. Um, <clears throat> this is the way it's always been. So I, I would just hesitate that we get caught up on that one item, although... I don't want to classify it as a smaller item because I understand some residents will look at that and say every penny counts and if it's there, it's there. So I can I can work a little harder on getting those out of there and I don't think uh, Mr. McCoy and, and the folks at the Housing Authority will have an issue um, making a decision in, within the next few days. I think we can come to that decision. They can also uh, pay us for it too. That is correct. That is part of the option. That's right. Now that conversation had been started and I have not revisited that with them in I'd say a couple of weeks. So I guess uh, I guess I will pick that up. I can I can sense your disappointment in the fact that they're not out of there yet and it hasn't been resolved and I can appreciate that counsel. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm less concerned with the fact that it's been a month and more concerned with can we um, set a timeline? Can we, you know, and I get it. I get Apparently, that. I could pull the rug out from under him tomorrow if you'd like, Counselor. <laughs> but, but I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say three days and then they say, hey, I need 10 um, to get a private vendor in here and then I've lied to you. Um, so what I can promise you I will do is have that discussion tomorrow um, and then get back to you. And I will uh, let you know what we've worked out and what that time frame is. Again, I don't want to misspeak again down here. Um, I misspoke about um, the, the payment and, and what actually happened and, and why it had happened. And then I, re I misspoke about the bins at the Housing Authority, uh, honestly thinking that they had already been removed um, mm -hmm. once we privatized, um, you know, um, oversight on my part. Don't and, and too much. Listen, I take blame for what I need to take blame for, Council. I appreciate that. I mean, I'm good. Um, I'm good with. I'm yeah, good with agreeing you know, that by so our next meeting, yeah, that we could absolutely, you know, have that final discussion. That's I, fine. I don't, I don't see why that two-week window can't be made to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, that's. And and, and in my discussion with them, they they see no no problem with us having an issue, and if they have to pay for it or they have to get their own private vendor, whatever's going to work best. They're, they're on board. They're willing to work with us on that and, and take it from there. And I will say the majority of them, as you said, there's 17 at Doolin and there's six at um, Oak Village. Uh, the majority of them, the, the lion's share of those carts for housing are at the townhouses that are mm -hmm. on the 4th Street area. And not all of those bins are put out each week. There's, there's only a handful of those that are actually put out. The rest stay in the yard and never move um, because there's not a lot of recycling in that, in that complex itself. So, you know, I'd say there's 60, 60 cart, some odd carts out there, um, but the 17, the 6, that's 23, I'd say maybe 30 of them are what's actually being put curbside each week. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's something important to understand as well. So yeah. there's probably half of those carts that actually don't get put out each week. And I don't want you to think that I don't understand that it's definitely of the entire picture. I realize yeah, it's not yeah. the largest portion of it. Yeah. It's just that, you know, 
if there's 20 things that are awry, well, it's still 20 things. Council, if, there's um, one if it's five, it's five. I, it's just, you know, it's a starting point, I listen, guess. Listen, if there's one thing I've realized about you in short order, that it, you're going to find to uh, comb it, and you're <laughs> going to find those little those little expenditures. I can remember a couple that you called out on the council, and, and you know what? You're doing your due diligence, and that's what you're here for. So I can appreciate that. I don't take anything that's said here personally. And no, and I you do, shouldn't, because you if, do do a great job. And, and if I do, I'll make sure you guys know. Yeah. Trust me. I'll say it in a respectful way, but you'll know that I take it as an offense. But I don't take this as an offense. But I will say... And, and we can't get down this road too far because I know it's in, in full council. But at the end of the day, Councillor, there are some significant issues that have taken place over the last couple of years that have put us in a very precarious position as far as not having the revenue we needed to mm -hmm. cover the cost of the bags. I mean, the, to cover the cost of disposal, rather. Um, and I think we're all well aware of what those things are. Um, and Councillor in C5, you know, is, is very apt and, and very, you know, cognizant of we can't keep digging into the taxpayer's pocket. Mm -hmm. um, but I, need, I say, where do we get it from? So I'm interested and excited to hear what your thoughts are on where these revenue streams are and some of your ideas. And, you know, let's, let's put the thoughts together and see if we can come up with, um, with with interesting ways to create and generate revenue. If it's not bags, if it's not a fee, then then how do we do it? So I'm all for that conversation. Yep. And I agree. And I I will never. And I've said it before. And I won't turn my head to any ideas on creating revenue. Certainly. Because it's only it's one of four or five ways to to uh, help a budget to maybe make a budget better. Um, obviously, you know, raising taxes, raising fees are two ways, but those are the easy ways. Sorry. And we need to, I think, um, especially now, and, and with 22 going to be a much more difficult year, we need to start trying to be a little more self-reliant. And, uh, and I know that you'll work hard, and I know that you, you, your goal is to make everything better. I appreciate and that. And you work for the city of Fall River. With Thank that, you, I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor and CDA, Councilor Pereira. I just uh, wanted to say to my colleague in C number two talking about um, housing authority with barrels and stuff. There are other things that have been done. I happened to get my hands on the transition report on trash. And I asked the mayor to meet with him. And I met with Mr. Perry, with Carlos, and Mike, the owner of uh, Easy Disposal. You know, looking at <coughs> rerouting the city. Instead of picking up 12 loads one day, five day loads the next day, rerouting the city so that it's all right hand turns and you can pick things up quicker. Looking at how to get rid of trash, um, I know South Coast Rail has containers that they can ship the trash away. Our port is second deepest to Boston, and we can get containers and ship them out uh, that way. Uh, what do we do with construction degree, with heavy item pickups, with families over four uh, that would be considered commercial? So. There's a lot of that. I, John, uh, Mr. Perry and I had that conversation, I don't know, two days ago, three days ago, la the end of last week, mm -hmm. to see where Republic, uh, where uh, Easy was on doing, um, you know, some of the rerouting that needs to be done. So there's a lot of things in the process uh, being looked at. I know that Mr. Perry's looking at it, and Easy Disposal and the mayor, um, we've all looked at it. Um, John doesn't take offense to anything I say because if you heard our phone conversations, you wouldn't even believe it. But, um, you know, we, I'm on him about, John, what can we do about this? What can we do about that? So, you know, I still say once in a while, John, what are we going to do with all the bags we have? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I got clean what ups. are we going to do with them? So there's, there's a lot of things in the fire, but they are working on some of this. And I think that it's premature for Mr. Perry to say, this is cut in stone of what we're going to do because he's working with Easy with the administration to look at um, a better way to do things. Uh, we've done that with Republic to do more cover there, so we're going to get more money from them on doing that. They have a transfer station ready to rock and roll as long as they had enough people to do something there. Really, what we need is to do something with trash regionally because everybody not just Fall River, everybody's having a problem with trash. In point of information, the entire country is exactly. having a problem. So. Everybody's <clears throat> having trouble with trash. So do we look at the mayor talking to the mayors from the, the Bristol County area 
and talk to you know the four major cities and the towns. What what can we do collectively? Let's all chip in. Maybe that's a road we have to take, but that's certainly not going to happen in a year. But there's a lot of things that we need to look at. I personally look at the federal government and say, why are you packaging things the way you do? Why not package things that are then biodegradable? I mean, come on, we've all bought a box of cereal this big and there's this much cereal <coughs> in it. Why, why are you doing that? It's just more trash. Um, I think years ago we recycled. How many gallons of milk you think people buy and throw them out? We recycled. We had a milkman, we put our, he came and put our milk at the door, we washed the bottles, put them back. That was good old rat fashion recycling. Today they talk about recycling, but we did it, right, Leo? Absolutely. There you go. Councilor, to answer your question from earlier about the soil project with Republic, right. um, they are site assigned for, from the EP to do what they do now. For the soil right. project, it requires another another. Well, they permit. have another one to go? They're mm -hmm. permitting, they're in that permitting process. Mr. Stefkovich from Republic is working with Mr. Dakers now uh, from the EP to try to get that process Good. straightened out, and we're, we're hopeful that we'll be getting that project going quite Mr. soon. Perry, That's another I just revenue talked stream. to you about that at three o'clock today. You already got an answer? Oh well that was I think that was a little that was a little earlier than than was it? Than three o'clock. It was earlier than yeah, three. that was earlier today. Well thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. With that I yield, but I just no. you know, we're doing stuff. Thank you. I yield. Uh, the final question on the quarterly update, Council on seat five, Council Lee. <laughs> uh, re total residency uh, total residences in Fall River. Thirty three thousand? Uh, the 30, 32,500, somewhere around okay. that council. Right. I'd have to I'll, check I'm gonna, my I'm going to use 33 as a reference and yeah. just go from there. I just wanted to get that figure um, for future reference. So mm -hmm. uh, with that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. No further discussion before the Committee on Finances. Shut, shut, shut. Stop. That hand. Councilor in seat seven, Councilor Pelletier. Just to make a comment. Many years ago, <coughs> the incinerator, we tried to get it. We tried to get it. And fell at that fear. We could have took care of all the region. And I said, you take the trash, you burn uh, the trash, and you save the cash. <laughs> and if you had the incinerator, we wouldn't be in trouble. But it's very difficult to get incinerated these days. Yeah. So you're going to ship it out, and it, it, we're spending all kinds of money. Yeah. But uh, I guess you'll, you'll never see it in Fall River. You know, I don't think they put any around the uh, United States, I guess. I don't know. Incinerators Council? Yeah. Very, That's very right. difficult. We don't have to go there. Yeah, very difficult. We went there. Uh, 18 years ago. Yeah. I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Motion to adjourn finance. Motion to adjourn. Motion second. second by Kil second. Councilor Kilby, seconded by Councilor Perer. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. We're going to do a three minute and 50 second break before <laughs> full council. Three, three minutes. minutes. 50 seconds. 50 seconds.